So again, thank you for uh, being with us and sharing uh, the latest um, uh, info about architecture in the age of uh, artificial intelligence. And yes, uh, we would like to also to thank to Professor Agustin Yuan and Claudio, our colleague um, Claudio Bersan Pipu. And I would like them to, to give us a short uh, introduction. Please, Professor Agustin Yuan. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, it's good to see, we, we kept in touch for a while, but then I lost track of him. So, but you know, his fame is uh, always there. So it's not that difficult to find him. Uh, and I've met Neil, I think 25 years ago, Neil, Cambridge 97 or something like that. I think before that, I think before that. Even uh, before, oh, that's right. You came to Bucharest with the Beyond the Wall, yada, yada. Yeah, and before that too, yes. I think it must before be 1994. Yeah. Anyway, I know I know Neil for a, almost a lifetime now. And we uh, work together. Uh, I, I have managed with his help, with his consistent help, I've managed to publish some of his books at the very early stage of their publication, like The Anesthetics of Architecture, which was 99, I think. Even himself was, uh, um, he was saying that uh, he granted uh, copyright to the uh, to MIT Press, except for the Romanian edition, everybody was making fun of it, but uh, there was the Romanian edition two or three months after that. And then Camouflage, one of his better books. All of them are very good, but I mean, from among the, the books he published. And of course, a very controversial book, which he, I think, didn't publish in English, which is called Forget Heidegger, which is published in English and Romanian back to back. So it doesn't have a fourth cover, it only has its first covers. So we managed to do that and to keep uh, him working with Romanian students, as you can see. One of his PhD students is here, Claudio Bersan, one of our best. Uh, products from your Minko, let's say. And so I'm terribly happy to see him, first of all. We used to be very young, especially me, and now we are getting old, especially him. Uh, but we are fine, we are still working, and I'm glad that I, I have, uh, we have an Illich with us tonight. Take care, pay attention to what he says. He's always the, um, how should I say, when uh, when Illich is signaling something, that, that means something is already going on. And you should pay attention to that because they're usually core subjects, very important things uh, shifting in a way the, 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 uh, the production of architecture. It wasn't just the books that I mentioned to you earlier, which were, let's say, postmodern, deconstructivist, or whatever, very high fashion at the, at the time. Now he's, he's telling you the story of a paradigm shift in the connection between man and machine. For those of you who are very young, it will happen during your lifetime, the singularity. And uh, I wish you good luck. <laughs> but, <laughs> but this is something preparing you for a singularity. I think his book, you know, you, you have it on the screen. I have it. Thanks to Andrea. Thank you, Andrea. I have it here with me. It's very interesting, it's very consistent, and is frightening. It's frighteningly good to begin with, but it's also frightening uh, with respect to the changes that will happen very soon. They are already happening elsewhere, anyway, in the, the way we do architecture. So thank you, Neil, for accepting to do this presentation for our students, most first and foremost. PhD students and uh, Ioana and Andrea students from Perin um, Stefan's studio. But there are also many more from uh, Cluj. I've, I've seen Shrebat yes. Tiganash here, and so on and so on. So yes. welcome everybody. Pay attention to what Nilich has to say, not just tonight. <laughs> I will have to withdraw at one certain point in time because I have classes from six, but I will, I promise I will, uh, follow the, uh, the, the the recording afterwards. So Neil, good to see you, man. Likewise. And keep up and keep up the good fight. Thank, thank you. 
Yes, thank you. So, what is here? Yes, we invited Claudio to say so, two okay. words before your presentation. So, don't worry, I'll keep it very short. So, uh, thank you for the invitation. And so, of course, uh, thank you, Neil, on many levels, right? Um, it's an honor, of course, to be his uh, PhD student. Uh, not only that, but also to see that Neil is uh, what I call one, one of the one of the few people that actually has this kind of third eye uh, looking into the future of what, uh, let's say, the, the the most important or the most most relevant shifts, uh, or I would say, even disruptive uh, uh, technologies and disruptive directions in the field of design architecture are. Right. So I think this is interesting. Today's discussion and in general. Uh, let's say the, the 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 types of discussions and the types of uh, of uh, let's say controversies that the field of AI is um, now creating. It's starting to create. We are still at the very very early beginnings of this phenomenon. So I think, like Augustine said, of course, I'm not 100% sure that we're going to hopefully we reach the singularity at some point during our lifetime. I may be not young enough to to reach it, but however, I think there's two uh, two things that we need to consider. One of them is the fact that this paradigm shift has two components, right? One of them is, of course, the way that the designer and the role of the designer is going to shift. And this will be very interesting to see, but basically, Neil is going to, to show some of the examples of, of different studios and the different designers in the world and the way that they actually use AI already as a creative design tool, as the, a tool not only to, to validate, but also to actually innovate. Right? So that's one very important aspect, I think. The other one has to do with the fact that we're now talking more and more about this kind of metaverse, this kind of beyond the, the reality or going beyond. And we will have this shift before the singularity. We'll definitely have the shift towards this kind of virtual worlds, at least in part, which means that we also have to discuss about means to create and to design this kind of virtual metaverses and virtual worlds. Um, basically, this is my, my field of interest. But again, this uh, uh, AI is definitely one of the the leading instruments that will actually power this kind of, um, of of kind of work, and of course we will discuss about and this will be a very interesting discussion to have maybe after this presentation to have a little bit of a, of a chat around what and how the, the role of the architect is uh, is going to shift and what um, uh, basically switching from this kind of uh, top down designer that has the control and it's fully in control of everything to a role that I, I would call embedded architect or some, some kind of design, designer intent that can be found in different layers of the design uh, process. So to me, this is a very interesting discussion. What Neil is uh, basically doing here, it's a, I think, first of all, a very, very good, not, not an introduction, but actually this book and the books that he's publishing are actually, uh, let's say, very good references to go to, to uh, if you want to understand, not just to grasp of some very, let's say, superficial understanding, but actually go a little bit deeper into how these processes already are, are being uh, set up and how they're uh, basically going to influence the, the, the design world, right? As I said, these are all disruptive technologies and the role of the AI, while, while we try to, to see it or to find it, is not by far defined. In my, in my perspective, it's still in the infancy of what is going to come. And, and Nila, I'm not sure, probably you already mentioned that while this book treats, let's say, the positive, there'll be a continuation, <laughs> like a second book, I say on the principle of white mirror, black mirror, that is going to tackle also the aspects are, which are not necessarily as positive or maybe other other ways in which the architect is going to be facing that very, let's say, aggressive in a sense, uh, shift in his um, way of thinking. And basically, even the, the work of an architect will completely diverge. Right. So again, this will be, this is, a, if I may say it, or I hope it's not a secret that this is the first book uh, of, of a series, right? Which will also uh, address the other side of the spectrum. But without, uh, I mean, uh, it's it will be a very interesting journey for sure. And for all the students, especially for students that want to, uh, that have heard about it or about architecture, or uh, sorry, about the uh, implication of AI in architecture, I think this lecture and the book itself uh, will be extremely important. You cannot escape it. It's something that is going to happen. It's going to affect all of us it's already affecting us basically it's not in, even in the future i would say that's it, already happening and it's it's so relevant for everyone to be to be uh, informed and at least to understand in, in general if not in detail what what this is about and what are the opportunities and also the, uh, the potential i would not say danger but again the disruptive shift that this is going to bring so 
let's see here from Romil and <laughs> thank you very much for, for taking the time to have this presentation with the Romanian students. So thank you very much, Neil. <laughs> Mulțumesc. Uh, 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 it's good to be here. Uh, I mean, Yaminko uh, Bucharest plays an important part of my background and, in a way, my my own outlook. And, and, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, and uh, thank you, Claudio, and thank you, Rob Wustin, for the um, introductions. Um, <clears throat> Let me start. I'm just showing you now some work by Refik Anadol, um, who is a media artist, and I will talk more about him as we go through. Um, what I um, just to start, I wanted to say something. Last time I gave a lecture, and I've been many times to to uh, Minku, especially in the '90s, and I forget exactly when it was, but when we first started, maybe '93, '94, I forget. But there was a conference we held '96, I think it was, um, with Doina Petrescu there and Greg Lynn um, and uh, Freddie Jameson and a few others. We actually invited um, uh, Slavoj Žižek and he almost came, uh, but he, he double booked. Anyway, it's always good to be part of this. And uh, I remain in conversation with a lot of uh, Romanians. Um, I was in conversation with, with uh, Doina Petrescu recently in a session with, with uh, Shumi and um, Peter Eisenman. So, um, but when I last gave a lecture, I, I remember that particular lecture for one particular reason, but actually there's a second reason I didn't was not, not aware of. The reason I remember it was that I had a very strange question from one of the students. And I, I forget what I was showing. I think it was uh, computational work by someone like Alisa Andrushek or someone like that. And um, one of the students asked me this question, but isn't the straight line sacred? Which I, is, isn't the straight line sacred? Which I thought was a very strange question. I don't know uh, why the student thought this. I was. I was guessing maybe it could have been one of Augustine's uh, students from his uh, architecture and uh, religion um, <laughs> course or something. But uh, but anyway, that was uh, I, I left and I thought that was odd. Um, but then there was something else happened which I don't I wasn't aware of the time I found out about it about four three four years ago. Um, there was a student in the in the audience, um, a, a new Minkle student in the, in the audience, audience who saw this and. Uh, it was, I guess it was a, maybe a Damascus moment or something, because suddenly he changed his life entirely. He decided to embrace what I was showing and at least look for, shall we say. So he, he, he left Iaminko and went to study at Angavanta. And he studied under Zaha Hadid um, and Patrick Schumacher. And then he went on to work for um, Wolf Pricks at Kor, Kor Pimmelblau. Um, and a, a, after that, he gradually became um, a computational expert, well, he, a, a very lead, a leading computational expert, expert. Um, and now I'd say he's one of the leaders in AI in the world. Um, and some of you have seen his work recently, um, uh, and that's Daniel Bolajan. Um, so and I'm also obviously aware of Claudia's work um, um, and know how talented uh, Romanians can be in this field. And I, I just hope maybe there's somebody in the audience today who is a young and dynamic um, designer who and computational person who will also be inspired by some of this and maybe become another world leader because it's clear that uh, Romania produces a lot of a lot of talent. Um, <clears throat> so today I want to um, talk about um, uh, my book that is or has already come out. Um, and I want to talk about it in connection with another book that is about to come out, um, an issue of architectural design that I guest edited with Matthias Del Campo. And these two books actually go together very well because the first book um, is it has very relatively few images in it. Um, I wanted to make it very cheap. Well, it's not that cheap, but it's cheaper than other books. Um, and so there are not many images, um, and uh, but a lot of text. Um, and then this one, which is the opposite, this issue of architectural design, which is a, which is a a, a, a lot of image, a, a lot of images, but very little text. The, the maximum length of an article is two thousand words. It doesn't. There's not much text at all in it. And th these two go together very well. But on, alongside that, I want to show today some videos um, that um, will will open it up even more. Um, there are two things I would say. One is that, that whatever you publish is out of date in this field before it's published, before it's actually coming out. And secondly, you really need to see these things um, in animated, the animated version. So I will talk about that. 
But what I want to say, start off by saying is that we are facing, a, a, we are at the moment, and I think it's right now, right now, we're at the moment in a very crucial um, uh, 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 paradigm shift, maybe, um, in how we approach architecture, because all of a sudden, this world is coming on stream. Um, and in the next few weeks, um, uh, these are the books that are coming out, um, five different books at least. I mean, I don't know any uh, um, uh, others, but I'm sure there are many um, that are coming out, all, look at, all looking at it from a very different angle. Um, so uh, um, there's a study of China is looking at how, it's, how it, the practices are using it. Um, there's um, a little book coming out, which I'm part of, it's more about urban planning. There's a book by Matthias Del Campo on, on his work, A Neural Architecture. There's also one by Phil Bernstein, which is about um, how the tools will change the way the office works. Uh, he works for Autodesk. And then there's, there's ours, and plus others. There's a, a Chinese translation that is, um, that is coming out of my own book um, and, uh, and so on. And indeed, there is this other book, uh, The Dark Side, shall we say, of AI. Um, and uh, since you come from the country of Vlad the, the Impaler of Dracula, I think maybe you'll appreciate the dark side of things. Um, I want to also say that there is something in the air that's happening um, in the sense of, 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 from a theoretical point of view, and it really is a, 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 the most exciting moment, as far as I can make out in terms of the debates that are going on um, in architecture since deconstruction, and maybe even before that, in, in terms of the kind of debates. So decon, of course, was a misunderstanding of, of the work of Derrida, but nonetheless, something happened in the late 80s, early 90s, that really changed architecture. And I think in, in many ways, we're seeing, gonna see the same, um, exactly the same. This is a series that I've been holding on a Sunday, uh, which um, is really, really astonishing because what it's doing is bringing together um, a whole series of different approaches from different people um, working both in AI and neuroscience and philosophy, and also uh, curiously in the world, uh, the, the world, the commercial world of, of, of um, um, of, 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 of commercialism um, and it's amazing because something is happening and it's about it's a theory of, of intelligence that I say I think is the most astonishing thing I won't say much more about it but there are these series of events which we've um, uploaded onto the digital futures um, website um, uh, I, I maybe I don't know if Claudia could find a, that link and just share it around but uh, we have two uh, two lecture series which are very astonishing one is this uh, the AI neuroscience and architecture um, which I am just being blown away by. And then there's also one on architectural philosophy. And here is the one in which Doina Petrescu was part of this discussion with about Jacques Derrida and, and Helen Sixou. Um, Bernard Schumi and Peter Eisman were also part of that. So anyway, there is a theoretical debate going on alongside this, which is really astonishing. And, and thirdly, there, there is so the books and then there's a theoretical debate. And thirdly, there is the design practice that is happening, um, the kind of work that's coming out. and and. I'm unable to show you the really astonishing work that I've seen the last three days because it's um it's part of a competition and it's not really released yet. But I want to suggest that we are at the moment um, in a kind of um, what Kaifu Lee calls a Sputnik moment. In other words, um, Sputnik when Sputnik was launched, America realized that they had to do something to be compete with the with the Russians, and uh, uh, they set up NASA. Um, uh, there's also the comments being made about about, um, <clears throat> about uh, and I'm just so I'm just showing you here some of the work that my students did last year. I mean, they're, just to show the kind of things that, that comes out from the studio. Um, uh, Kai Fuli talks about the moment, and there was one particular match of of Go, which is very famous in AI circles, and I'll mention it later. When the world was astonished by what AI could do, suddenly everybody realised this is amazing, um, and that's what led to. Um, huge investment in AI on the part of China and um, uh, um, and Korea. Uh, but the, the world basically woke up to the potential of that. I want to put this alongside what I would call um, the, <clears throat> the kind of Bill Bao moment when for architecture, we began to realize that uh, there was something new happening um, and, that, and that not only was there something new happening, but these buildings could be built. These buildings could be built and they would transform society. Uh, the Guggenheim in Bilbao really did transform the city there. Um, and uh, it, it opens up all these all these new possibilities. I think we are now at that moment, whether we call it the Sputnik moment, whether we call it the Bilbao moment, whatever, something new is happening. This is my, one of my students who is doing 
um, some work which is kind of breeding um, the work of morphosis with a, some very traditional um, uh, Miami architecture. Um, we are at the moment that something as astonishing is, is happening, and it's happening in 2022, the first half of 2022, I think, is that moment um, when the world will wake up to, to what is happening um, in, in AI. Um, <clears throat> this is the, another one of my students' work. This is a, uh, what happens when you train a GAN um, on the work of um, Zaha Hadid architects. Uh, uh, what's happening here is it's a, a cycle GAN, and my student, Fernando Salcedo, is his is t-shirts on the left hand side this is his wardrobe and when you filter these images on the left through the lens of a neural network trained on the work of this particular project by Zaha it's a, a research center in Saudi Arabia you suddenly get architecture uh, emerging that is kind of interpreting Fernando's t-shirts and turning it into a new thing this is uh, his his ties and wardrobe uh, and another neural network trained on the on downtown um, the generic modernist architecture of downtown um, Miami and here his, his, his tie turns into a tower block. Um, and, and my students are fascinated by this, absolutely fascinated by this. And not only fascinated in terms of what they can do in the studio, they're also fascinated by what, they, what it means from a theoretical perspective. I would say that 90% to 95% of my students work on AI when, I, when they did write an essay in my advanced uh, theory class. Um, it, it, is, it is a particularly interesting kind of moment. So. <clears throat> The big question, whenever I'm, I give a lecture, what is AI? The, 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 one of my lectures got 4,000 hits because everybody wants to know what AI is. We kind of know what it is, but we don't know what it is. And I think it's important to really... So I want to say a few words of introduction about what is AI before I, I launch onto this roller coaster um, journey. Um, and maybe before we even ask the question, what is AI? We need to question, ask the question, where is AI? Um, because in fact, um, AI is everywhere around us. It's kind of arrived on the scene and we haven't been fully aware of it, um, but it's on, your, it's on your phones, on your smartphones, on your, on your mobile phones. It's what um, filters out the spam on your um, emails. Um, it's what identifies your friends um, on Facebook. It's what does all, all sorts of different sort of things. Um, and it's, it's not only just working on our computers, it's, it's what's, you know, it's, it's colonized the, the space of the home. It's where Siri and Alexa are kind of responding to things. It's controlling our heating system through Nest thermostats and so on. And when we're driving our cars, it's kind of, it's telling us where to go. Um, it's telling us the quickest route. It's, it's warning us when our car's straying out of line, out of lane and so on. It's literally everywhere all around us, um, but we're not fully aware of it. Um, it's somehow arrived. Um, and in my book, I, I, I stress how the way to understand AI is not in the traditional kind of Hollywood way where you think it's a, some kind of robot. Um, well, robots may themselves be controlled by AI, but really <coughs> AI <coughs> sorry, um, is all about algorithms. It's all about, it's basically software. Um, and in, from that point of view, it's essentially invisible. You, you're not going to see it. You might see the, the effect of it, but you don't see it as such. And so the comment I make in the book is um, it is as though the Earth has been invaded by an invisible, super intelligent alien species. Um, and it is, or it can be, super intelligent. So <clears throat> it was Alan Turing who um, was the first to um, speculate about the possibility of, let's say, computational intelligence in an article he wrote and published in 1950. But it wasn't until 1956 that the term itself was coined um, by a group of uh, individuals who met for a, a summer workshop in Dartmouth College. Um, and here they are on the top. You can probably recognize Marvin Minsky here. Um, but so these were the kind of the figures who then met up again 50 years later in a reunion. Um, and what is interesting about this is that the, the 2006 was actually a crucial moment in the history of AI because when they met, it was actually in some senses a disappointing moment because everybody realized that actually AI hadn't achieved any, anywhere near what everyone had expected. Um, but, but then in 2006, something happened, a kind of what could be called the uh, deep learning revolution, um, when neural networks suddenly burst onto the scene and, and everybody realized um, um, what they could do. Um, I won't go into the history, but, but let's just say that 2006, um, uh, an approach towards AI called connectionism 
that somehow had been overlooked in favor of what one called some symbolism. Eventually, people realized that actually neural networks could really do this amazing work. And something happened. And since 2006, everything has been transformed. But the problem is we still use the term AI as though it's a kind of generic term. And it's, the, 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 it's a bit like the word car. If you look at the, the, the beginnings of the first car, it's still called a car, right? Um, but what we have today in terms of the kind of self-driving Teslas and so on is so much different to what we had at the very beginning. And the same happens with AI. Um, what we have now is completely of a different order um, to what it was like back in the, the, the late 50s, but um, it, we still use the term AI. Um, so what is AI? This is a definition that um, Margaret Bowden has given, um, and uh, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, I mean, I, I think her book is fantastic, but I, I actually think this definition is, 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 uh, is old fashioned now. AI seeks to make computers do the sort of things that human minds can do, minds can do, because first of all, it can, the computers can do things way beyond what, uh, what, what human minds can do. Um, and uh, I think we're in a different stage, um, but that was book was written in 2016. Um, <clears throat> one way to understand the different types of, of, um, uh, of AI or the dominant types, shall we say, um, is through this sort of diagram where you have AI or the bigger category of AI and within that machine learning, which has been around for some time, but is now coming to prominence thanks to different factors. And eventually this, uh, this one, deep learning, um, which is now the dominant form, um, is what does it all the translations and so on. Um, <clears throat> And that's been facilitated by a number of things. The obviously the improvement in algorithms, the, the amount of data available, um, the use of the cloud, and the sheer investment and the competition that's going on um, into the into, into AI itself. And, and so they're, they're nested in, inside each other, a bit like Russian dolls in, inside one another. But um, this is essentially what I want to deal with today: um, deep learning, which is is a particular category that's only been around. Uh, for a few years, um, um, but which is really having the impact, which is transforming um, the architecture itself. So, sorry, the, the, um, <clears throat> transforming uh, the way we approach computation. So just to say something about neural networks, I mean, the, uh, on the left hand side, we have the, the neurons and the synapses of the brain, um, which are very, very different to the neurons and synapses of the neural network. Um, uh, but the term has been used. Uh, shall we say they're loosely inspired by uh, the neurons of the brain? Um, and here, what we have on the on the right is a neural network, and these are the neurons, and these are the synapses, and the flow of information from left to right is governed by the weights on these synapses. And we go through these hidden layers, and maybe there could be up to a thousand hidden layers, um, and eventually you 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 end up with a with a result um, going from left to, to right, feed forward, as it's called. Um, so, and some people don't even use the word uh, neuron. Um, Melanie Mitchell has written a very, very good book about AI, prefers to use the word unit because it's so different, the neuron to the brain. But nonetheless, they are really um, effective. Um, and in, to, my, to my mind, we're still in a situation where we don't know quite what's going on in a neural network, the hidden layers, we don't know what's going on fully yet in, in, in terms of the brain, despite what some people would say. I think we're, they're both black boxes. But the point is eventually is, is that actually we have AI now and it, it is effectively the way we think about this at the moment is more as a form of extended intelligence. Um, it's not necessarily AI versus humans so much as AI as an extension of the capacity of human beings. And this is a comment from Elon Musk. All of us already are cyborgs and that includes everybody what, listening to this lecture. We're all cyborgs. Um, you have a machine extension of yourself in the form of your phone and your computer and all your applications you are already superhuman um, and we can do amazing things no question so this is basically Elon Musk's view um, <clears throat> but the central question that's the kind of brief brief, brief um, overview and I've left out a lot there but um, about what is AI but the central question has always been um, whether you can use it um, at least for architects whether you can use it to generate um, generate images so the question I want to look at now is whether can machines dream can computers, can AI generate um, something new? Uh, and the standard view is, is or has been, um, up until very recently, that no, um, human beings uh, are, are, are the only ones who can, can, can produce something that does not yet exist. 
uh, machines could do certain things, but in terms of, let's say, let's call it creativity for the moment, um, uh, uh, machines do not have dreams. People are the only ones who can create an image that does not yet exist. This is, these are the words of Makoto Se Watanabe, who's a Japanese um, computational expert. I think Claudia must have heard him at, um, in, uh, in Tongji a few summers ago. Um, but he does leave open the possibility that maybe in the future they will. So he's not that conservative, um, but this is a statement that we can maybe look at and challenge. So, um, and what was was interesting, the first steps in this was about, well, this was like 2015, which was um, when they realized that if you take a neural network that typically recognizes things. Um, now, this this might be these days quite uh, an everyday thing. We have um, facial recognition on our phones, and um, but this is very new. This is actually very, very new, this process. So what you get here is a, is an image, and it's uh, the information propagates it through for these 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 different layers, and eventually you recognize and say it's a bird, um, and that's it's actually pretty impressive. It's never hundred percent convinced. It's normally ninety nine percent convinced, but it uh, it's pretty accurate. If you train it enough on birds, you will recognize birds. But what happened in in two thousand fifteen is that. Uh, uh, um, a neuroscientist working for Google, a guy called Alex uh, Morgenseth, realized that if you if you did the opposite way, if you started with the word bird, you could use the same neural network and in the end um, synthesize or create an image of a bird. Um, and it, it produced these very strange um, and extraordinary images um, that now we know as Deep Dream. Um, and Deep Dream is what is curious about it. Some information has been lost um, as you process it in the first first stage. Um, so when you then uh, reverse the operation, you lose uh, the positioning. So it becomes pose invariant. You get these crazy, um, these, I clearly this network train on dogs and maybe uh, lizards or snakes or something. And you get this very strange image that is quite shocking. Um, what I find interesting from a, from a theoretical perspective, and I won't say much about theory today, but there is some there are some interesting things, and I think AI becomes a mirror in which to understand what it is to be human. Um, but what I think for, is interesting from a theoretical perspective, you just go back a second. If you think about how a theorist works, or a historian works, or a critic, and so on, the critic basically is um, uh, analyzing analyzing the the, the visual material and, and coming up with a comment. Um, whereas uh, a creative person, a designer, well, uh, operates in the opposite direction. You, you, you basically, you generate something. Um, and it seems to suggest those two modalities of criticism and then of generation are the opposite, which probably explains why most theorists are not necessarily designers and most designers are not necessarily theorists. Um, but it does open up some interesting kind of questions. But the real breakthrough came, and this is something we discussed, Claudio, and I remember talking about it with him um, uh, about five, six years ago, I guess it was five years ago, maybe, were just, uh, generative adversarial networks, GANs, because they these have really transformed um, the uh, the world of, of AI. Um, and these actually came about in 2014, but they didn't filter through into the world of art and architecture until a little bit later. And what you have with this is two different neural networks, which one is a generator um, and one is a discriminator. So one is the critic, as it were, and one is the, the designer. Uh, and they're competing against each other. So they compete against each other. So you, you, the generator, uh, out of random noise, produces images and then the discriminator compares it against the, a, a training set and either rejects it as being not good enough or um, accepts it. So it's a little, bit like, a little like the Turing test in some senses. But the two train each other. The generator trains the discriminator, and the discriminator tra trains the generator. Um, and so, till eventually, you can remove the discriminator, and the generator will keep generating um, a high standard of images because it's been trained in this way. So, once more, you can somehow see that that uh, um, the the difference between a, a, a critic and a um, and a designer. Um, they both train each other. In other words, uh, the critic is someone who comes in to really. Uh, uh, ask tough questions in terms of design and to improve the design. Um, meanwhile, the, the theorist is uh, inspired by the creativity of the generator and, and so on. So, um, but what this produced then were these things called GANs, the Generative Adversarial Networks. You can think about this a little like in terms of an art forger. Someone's going to try and produce a fake Van Gogh, then the art critic decides whether it is a real Van Gogh or not. And it's a similar kind of mechanism. <clears throat> but out of this, 
all of a sudden this appeared. This is Style Gans 2. Um, and the, the initial um, area they started working on was um, faces, uh, mainly because, I mean, Hollywood faces as well. There, there are so many images on the internet. Um, and this, first of all, it disproves or it challenges the notion that the, uh, Watanabe had said that uh, uh, computers can't produce uh, anything that does not already exist. Uh, this is from a website, or you can go to a website called This Person Does Not Exist. And every time you refresh your browser, you can see uh, a face being produced, generated, of someone who does not yet exist. It's been hallucinated, shall we say, by the computer, and it is very, very convincing, and they get better over time. And this really made people pay attention to the capacity of what GANs could do. They can produce some um, disturbingly realistic faces. I mean, in, in, you can therefore see how they can be used for fake images. Um, <clears throat> But I want to turn to, to Refik Amador as a figure who I think has been crucial in the development, certainly in terms of where I am in LA, which has become a place, a center for much of this research, partly because it's been sponsored by Google and partly because um, of the work that's been going on in places like UCLA Media Art and also in SIARC. Um, Refik Amador is, a, um, um, is from Turkey, from Istanbul in Turkey. Um, and he's not an architect, uh, but he uses buildings, both as his material, his data, for his images and uh, for his hallucinations, and also as his his canvas, as it were, he projects he projects uh, these images onto buildings. So uh, buildings are his material, but also his canvas. And in two thousand and twelve, uh, uh, Refik um, came to LA to I'm in LA right now. Um, came to LA and uh, um, <clears throat> To study on the media art course at UCLA, and the first thing he did when he arrived at two o'clock in the morning um, at LAX, at Los Angeles International Airport, was to take a taxi to go and see the work of his hero Frank Gehry, the the Walt Disney Concert Hall in downtown LA, and this was was a hugely inspiring building for him. But when he got there, all he saw was this because the lights were off, the building was as it were asleep, and uh, he decided he wanted to bring the building alive. Um, and he want, he, that was one of his projects to, to, to make it come alive. Um, and so, um, so what he did was, um, uh, was to, uh, in 2018, he was very fortunate to be invited by, um, by, the, Walt, uh, by the LA Philharmonic to make an installation um, for, uh, um, for a, an event that was going to mark the, the 100th anniversary of the LA Philharmonic. And he basically took all the archives of um, the building and uh, processed them and then projected onto the facade of the Walt Disney Concert Hall um, the work that he was doing. Um, and, uh, and this, I think, was it wasn't the first moment that neural networks had been used, and, and certainly it wasn't even the first moment that architects had been using it. But somehow, this very high profile moment in October 2018, when 42 um, projectors were trained onto the building and this installation happened, that really was, in some senses, the moment when uh, neural networks met architecture, in a, in symbolically, in any way. Um, and this was a uh, this was also accompanied by some music that had been generated using AI. Um, so it was a kind of a package of something that. Uh, suddenly made people aware that this is what the world of, of AI could do um, in a very high profile way. Um, uh, I can't show you, can't play the music for copyright reasons, but maybe I can just give you a few seconds just so you can hear the music in the background. Well, actually, it wasn't the best best part of the music there, you know. But anyway, I can only give I think five seconds before I contravene the the copyright. But this was this was a, a crucial sort of moment. Um, and anyway, but it was an architecture itself. It was it was simply projections onto a building. The then question came when whether we could actually um, hallucinate buildings themselves. And this happened. Um, we actually in two thousand nineteen we had planned. I'd put in a proposal for the British Pavilion at the Venice Biennale with Zaha Hadid Architects uh, to collaborate with Google and with Refik. And it was a dream team. Um, and we were rejected. We didn't even get into the short 
honest. And I think this is the most amazing thing that by now, and we're only talking about three years later, um, uh, AI, AI has become the hot thing. The, the issue of AD that, that hasn't even been released yet has already become a bestseller. So it's clear that things have changed. And what happened even before that um, we, we had been planning to actually do this is that Refik did what we were planning to do. And that is to say, here he's taking a data set of the work of Zahidid and hallucinating buildings. Um, so you feed it through, this is a kind of version of style GANs and um, it's hallucinating things. Um, and of course it's based on the data set you're using. I think this has got Soho in, in Beijing being used a lot um, because it's somehow it's, it's reflecting that. But what is, I think, really astonishing about this is that some moment you, you get a sense of um, there's something that comes out that is quintessentially Zaha. It's almost like you don't need to have Zaha to produce Zaha already in the office. And of course, she's no longer with us, but there are 400 mini Zahas, as it were, producing Zaha. But what this demonstrated very, very quickly, very early on, and this is very primitive, it's one of the first, I think it's the first ever one, maybe I'm wrong. Um, of a use of style gans to hallucinate buildings, you could see that all of a sudden um, it, it could produce something that was really instantly recognizable as possibly a design by Zaha. Not the same as anything's done, but a kind of interpolation, shall we say, an image that is generated based on this data set that came up with something that is that is quintessentially Zaha. And in a few seconds, um, we will see uh, precisely that one image but there are many of course but this one is particularly interesting because it um, it does produce something quite novel and astonishing um and uh, and that is this um this is the image that we used on the front cover of the book um and i should say that there are actually two books I, when i was working on this i was i was a bit like Elon Musk because i was astonished by what ai can do but also i was kind of terrified of what it could do um and in fact there, 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 are, there are two versions. There's a, the white cover, um, uh, which is about the angel, the 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 good side of AI, and, and the black cover, which is the Vlad the Impaler side of AI. Um, anyway, so let me introduce those of you who don't know Daniel. Daniel is really um, something of a genius. I really respect him. Um, from Ian Minkel, via Angavanta, via Paul Pimoblau, now a professor at Florida Atlantic University. He actually worked with, with uh, as a colleague of mine at Florida International University um, in Miami, although I'm based in LA, I have my jobs, my main jobs there, and also Tom G. Um, and uh, anyway, um, <clears throat> Daniel is a responsible, uh, uh, he's the genius behind this work coming out of Corp Himmelblau's office, uh, the project called Deep Himmelblau, um, which is or maybe like I say was until about a week ago, <laughs> the state of the art, the most impressive um, application of a deep learning to um, the world of architecture. And it's very sort of sophisticated. We don't know exactly what um, what Daniel has been doing um, because some of the techniques are uh, haven't been disclosed, but it's basically using um, a, a, a cycle GANs, which I'll explain. Um, uh, to hallucinate buildings based on a data set of all the previous work of Corp and the Himmelblau. Um, and as we think about deep learning is it, it, it so these neural networks, they improve over time. They improve with the amount of data that you have and they improve as they, um, as they, they, they develop over time. Uh, as you probably noticed that some of the translation apps on phones, for example, I use WeChat a lot and the, the Chinese translation has, has got unbelievably good. Um, it's it's improving all the time. So this is something that's been winning awards last year. It won two awards, um, Digital Futures Award, the Acadia Award, and uh, it's really something that um, uh, is is state well state of the art. And it, and it came out because of Daniel. And here are some of the stills. And you can see kind of glitches, you know, things that are still not perfect. And frankly, if you see something that looks perfect, be suspicious because it probably means that some someone in human has intervened to tidy it up but this is the kind of stuff that's coming out uh, and and actually it's not bad it's it's um it's interesting and wolf Pricks is absolutely delighted by it he sees it um he had a, a, an event on digital futures where he was in conversation with tom main of morphosis and it, it was called from decon to ai and wolf Pricks, who of course we was 
it was somebody who was came uh, appeared uh, um, uh, on surfing on the wave, as it were, of decon. Um, uh, it was somebody who made his name through math, and he sees AI as being the next, as it were, decon moment. I think it's going to have way more effect than decon, but that's the way that he sees it. Um, and uh, anyway, this is some of the work that was uh, from last year. Um, and then this is the use of cycle GANs, where, where you use two unpaired data sets, in this case, um, a video of clouds and um, the COP and the Lao buildings. Um, and the word, the name Himmelblau, which has got L in brackets, be, means both Himmelbau, in other words, building in the sky, and also Himmelblau, which means sky blue. So the f use of clouds uh, for to pair it up with, with COP Himmelblau makes a lot of sense as well. Anyway, um, so they have been producing something um, uh, uh, pretty interesting. Um, um, that's been going on. And this is Daniel's own work. Um, uh, he's been researching the Sagrada Familia. Some of you have seen this. I know that he gave a conference um, in in Bucharest, not in Niaminko, but in Bucharest, and uh, apparently people were astonished. Um, I I mean, everyone is astonished by this. Daniel is a central player in, in promoting AI. He's one of maybe the leading, perhaps, of one of the AI architecture people in the world. Um, and uh, this is him uh, using, pairing up the interior of the Sagara Familia with um, a video of walking through a, a forest. Uh, this is again in CycleGAN's unpaired data sets, but the trees of the forest and the columns, you can see the trees of the forest here, the columns of the Sagrada Familia, uh, as it were, bred off against each other to produce a kind of hybrid entity, which is the result, as it were, of both. And, uh, so something new and something fresh and extraordinary um, is appearing that is really captivating the minds of, uh, of the young today. It is absolutely captivating my students. And whenever I show this, wherever I show this work, um, everyone else also gets captivated by it. So, and there is someone from Yamingu originally who has been in part responsible for introducing these techniques um, into the world of architecture. There were actually a lot of people that, uh, well, a lot of people claim to don't know much about uh, the, uh, about uh, AI and not so many actually really know about it from a technical perspective. And I think that Daniel Bolojan, along with two or three others, uh, maybe three or four, maybe, um, really knows what is happening here and is really at the front of things. Um, I don't do the technology itself. Whenever I teach, I've asked um, Daniel to run a workshop on this and uh, this is something in which everybody is, I think, completely fascinated by at the moment. Um, so, um, and then there's also, uh, I would say, um, not one of the other people involved in this is Emmanuel Coe, who was a, a graduate of the AADRL, um, did a PhD on um, AI in Lausanne in Switzerland, and is now a professor at Sing Singapore. He actually wrote, I think, the first book in English about AI and, and architecture. It, it's a, it was not well distributed and you would we'll see it around, but he is the, the pioneer in many ways. And uh, here he's been looking at the whole question about how you could um, generate three dimensional forms. And that's uh, something that is very difficult at the moment with AI because AI produces two dimensional images. The other problem is you can't really control it as yet. So we are still at an early stage, um, and this is some of the experimentation that's exploring the possibility of how we might begin to work in a three-dimensional logic. I mean, it's worth saying, of course, that architects do work in 2D. Plan sections and elevates, plans, sections and elevations are themselves 2D representations, and uh, so you can clearly hallucinate plans and things, but, and, and, and sometimes what appears to be a three-dimensional form but isn't uh, comes out of the computer. So anyway, I just want to say that this is a this is Emmanuel Coe is also one of these uh, individuals who's been kind of pushing these things and has been doing it in a particular kind of way. It might look kind of conventional because he's doing using looking at stand, standard tower blocks, but actually what he's talking about is something that I think is is uh, increasingly um, interesting. Um, so um, so let me let me move on. Um, and in terms of, let's say, I would say student work, this is actually the work of Giovanna Pelaca, who is, um, she was a student, now she's become a professor in, in Chile, and she was doing a workshop on digital futures. Last summer, we had over 20 workshops looking at AI um, on digital futures. And this is one that is using 
um, VQ GAN and, um, uh, and CLIP. Uh, I won't go into the details of CLIP, but um, it comes out of a natural language processing system called GPT-3. And when you combine these two, actually, they all of a sudden you can produce something fairly quickly. This is a, a like a five day workshop um, that is itself astonishing. They what this uses is um, the GPT-3 is a uses natural language is using text, but it pairs it up with the, like the captions, as it were, for an image. It finds the images that go with the text that go with certain words. Now, the words that have been used here, there were two sets of words. One was what was called a pre-prompt. So you have some words that condition the whole thing. Um, and the pre-prompt was the work of, um, of Yang Sung Ma, the, the Chinese architect, the, the student of Zaha's original, Yang Sung Ma, uh, uh, Wolf Pricks, and also Tom Maine Morphosis. And then the, the prompt itself um, was futuristic Indian temple. And out of this, this thing is hallucinated. And those who did this workshop um, are terrified. They, they, they're terrified by what this thing can do and what it can hallucinate. Uh, and this is just an early little stage of, of, of work. But when you look at some of the stills, you know, it is astonishing. You think, oh my God, where did that come from? Um, so this gives you the sense of what anybody in the audience could do, basically after a, a short workshop and maybe Maybe you could invite Daniel or someone to come to a workshop on all of this because it is a new a new chapter in terms of um, of architectural design for sure. Um, but more, I guess, and because it's out of control, um, it's more a kind of let's call it maybe a, a, a muse. It can open up the possibilities way beyond the imagination of what humans can think about. So it can become an extension of the, what you do as an architect and, and hallucinating possibilities out there. Um, alongside that a use of AI, that creative use of AI, one can also talk about new creativities, new creative practices that are emerging that use AI alongside other tools, Unreal Engine and so on, to um, produce something uh, novel. This is a, a project that's done by a group from um, from SIAP, Casey Reem, Laura Michelin, she was there at the time, and then uh, a, a team from uh, Life Forms, Serbian guys, um, uh, uh, um, Damian Jovanovic and uh, Lydia Krakovic. And this is a, uh, the, it's taking the Piranesi's famo, famous Campo Marcio um, uh, plan, and it's, it's not only hallucinating um, a three dimensional version of that, but also these uh, AI powered agents, whatever you might call them, who are navigating and exploring this um, terrain. So um, we're seeing, this is probably worked about, I guess about two years ago, maybe longer ago. So we're seeing something novel, which has been part of a creative a new new world. Uh, let me just, I wanna show the next one, I wanna show you, I've got the sound on, I'll just keep quiet and maybe you can you can get a sense of what it is. So the next one is gonna be some work by life forms themselves. Uh, so Damien and, Yuan and, and Lydia um, using AI to generate, um, Figures in the metaverse, shall we say. So um, let, me, um, let me just play that. The feeling of distance is quite different. The fingertips, the light, the sound, the colors of the cloth are all currents in the brain. feature of our personality. A few pleasant surprises await us in life. The world that follows us. Okay, so, um, I mean, this, I guess, you could see, is, you could see it's kind of the metaverse. What I... 
would like to think it of as and it's one of my doctoral candidates when you heard is actually using the metaverse um not simply as representational thing but as a form of a digital twin whereby you can model things now digital twins have been used um for example uh, there's a, a company in china that is uh, produces something called city brain which uses uh, a, a, a digital twin to control the traffic you basically in real time you can you you feed information and it can respond and find ways of um, of, of blocking the um, of, of solving traffic jams and so on um, and and what this could lead to eventually and uh, what is what um, when you talk talking about is the possibility of having a, a uh, using agents, so we say agents and a kind of a, an exoskeleton like um, environment where these are kind of competing against one another and one can begin to generate architecture by simulating it um, and, and, and designing it according to different scenarios. So uh, that's a, a long way off, but that's the promise that it holds that basically, you know, you can begin to use these techniques to to design, to use it to design, to create a, a building as a form of exoskeleton to these agents. Um, and then that'll happen sooner or later. So it, the metaverse itself, I find really rather disappointing and boring. I mean, what's the point? It's just about representation. But if you can use it as part of the process, then all of a sudden you're talking about something very, very different. Anyway, so what we're seeing, and this is part of this is in, in the AD and also in my book, I've got a, a still image of this. Um, I hope it's not too jerky on the screen because anyway, this is this is what's being produced. Um, so this is uh, uh, Wang Yuhe, who is um, one of my doctoral candidates at Florida International University. Um, she's um, uh, from China. She worked, she studied in the Berlaga in, in Amsterdam at the time and uh, then worked for OMA for uh, eight years. And now she has a company called X Cool. X Cool is, of course, it means both X Cool House, um, because she worked for Rem Kohlhaas, um, and also in the Urban Dictionary, it means super cool. Um, now, what Wan Yu is doing, uh, what she was doing was fairly straightforward, but I think what I would say is now we could, we're seeing something, and I want to show you in a moment, um, not her most recent project, but I think what her, one of her, um, well, one thing that talks about a different transition. So this is this is what they were doing a few years ago, um, and this is a, the architectural equivalent of the way uh, of the, the the project that i showed you before the this person does not exist where those hollywood like uh, faces were being hallucinated by the um computer and these are buildings hallucinated by the computer and in fact there was a they had it um uploaded to their website it was a big expensive in data and they pulled it down again eventually but this is what they were doing it was a and you could it was this this building does not exist they were they were basically hallucinating these buildings um and uh this was state of the art, I guess, about four years ago when they started doing it. Something was very novel, um, and they're producing. Um, X Cool has now got about two hundred employees and about a hundred thousand um, clients um, who are using their software, and they're producing um, off uh, our software that is that is being used largely by developers at the moment. Um, um, but uh, and here you can see some modernist buildings that are coming out from the computer, and you know. They're not bad. They're not bad. Again, none of these buildings exist. It's simply been generated through, through hallucinated through the computer. But more recently, um, there have been two projects where um, they uh, have been working on one. And I'm just going to show you um, the, the, the first one. And I only got this video at midnight last night. So I haven't actually, apart from um, uh, uh, putting it into the presentation, I haven't even um, really had a chance to even look at it closely. This, if you look on here, we can see a, a block here that has been uh, processed and it's environmentally, it's to do with, with comfort and so on. And they're trying to work out what forms um, might uh, produce the most environmentally um, comfortable landscape. And what is interesting is this rectilinear block has been broken down into smaller forms until you get these um, more Frank Gehry type shapes, shall we say, that have been produced by the computer. and. Uh, this this shifts it entirely from the very rectilinear logic, um, the the straight line is sacred logic, shall we say, um, to another domain, um, and it's 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 doing this um, uh, for environmental reasons, um, uh, and 
I don't even know this process exactly what it's doing. It looks to me like topological optimization, but I, I don't know exactly. But what I'm just showing you is something that is emerging. And here they are, these forms that have been calculated by the by the computer. Um, they've got they're producing something that is that is that is different. It's 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 a uh, it's Gary like and not so uh, rectilinear. Um, and this was a competition they entered um, and uh, competed against 200 or so architects um, and they won. Uh, they won the they won the competition. The other one, which I can't um, show you, which I wish I could, because it is it just it's it's mind blowing. The other one, um, they compete against Snow Heta and MVRDV, and um, uh, I think they're going to win this competition. There's no reason. I mean, I've been I've been judging competitions when when Snow Heta have been in it, and uh, this they, what they're doing, and I can't show it yet, but I wish I could. Is mind blowing. What you also they they're using AI for lots of different sort of purposes here. They're also using it in terms of the panelization system and trying to reduce it down to a few uh, series of primitives. And what they discovered is AI could go way beyond what the people who are working for Gary Technologies could do. Uh, and, it, and it was this this technique then is, is, is opening up a, a new realm of creativity. And it's not the kind of the, the world of the developer world of, of boxes. It's something else that is appearing. Um, and mark my words, this 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 kind of work once, and I don't. This is pro, this is the first time, I th I'm sure this is the first time this work has ever been seen in the West. Nobody has seen this video uh, outside of China uh, until today. So you're getting a sense of something, and I don't think it's perfect yet. Don't think it's perfect yet, but you're getting something that is being, it is really is able to compete with humans, um, and uh, this is entirely highly AI generated and uh, you will see in the next month or so the the project I'm I other the other project I can't talk about I wish I could show it but I promised I wouldn't um which is the next step uh, and uh, actually when you was so disturbed about how good it was she was terrified that people would worry because it would lead to the death of the architect because people suddenly realized that actually AI is is just beyond us it goes at the level of, of operations which um which we with which we can't compete. I, I'm talking about something you can't see. I I've seen it, but uh, just watch this space. That's what I want to say: is watch this space because um, we are about to witness something that is going to be a transformative moment um, in terms of architectural culture. Architecture will never be the same again. Um, yesterday we were we were had a session on um, uh, with uh, uh, a guy called. Um, with a neuroscientist um, called Jeff Hawkins, and he said that he thinks the AI generation, the AI revolution, is going to be way more significant than the computational revolution. And I completely agree with that. Um, uh, and we're just we're just at the early stages of this. Um, ben Bratton has an expression where he says that we are in the silent movies period of computation. In other words, you think about the silent movies that were happening in the nineteen I don't know nineteen twenties, and we're just at the beginning of computation from that point of view, but we're just at the very beginning of AI. It's even more, as it were, the silent movies period, but it is going to, you haven't got to be um, a, a soothsayer. You, it, it's obvious where it's going and what it's going to produce. And it's speeding up, shall we say, according to the logic of, of Moore's law. Um, and there's something novel that is being presented. So this is a project, no one else has seen it before in this, in this video format anyway that is, I think, the first of a series that are going to make architects a wake up. Um, and you know, I was saying this before, and I think Claudio is probably in common with many people was very dismissive and maybe rightly so, I don't know, about the early work of, 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 of XCool, which was very um, developer oriented. It was simply about um, producing the most efficient tower blocks um, and so on. This is something radically different um and uh, watch this space so here it is on a chinese landscape and there are these rock-like forms um okay so um so let's move on to um another company producing software ai because what i th think is and this is an important point is that what is going to transform architecture is not going to be the radical designs of the most progressive designers it's not going to be daniel bolajan and more pricks and 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 all the kind of the crazy stuff that's appearing uh, out of you know, my students, or indeed SIAC, or, or wherever else, the Bartlett, or somewhere else, it, it's not going to be that. That's not going to be the game changer. What's going to be the game changer 
um, is going to be the software that's used in the architectural office. Um, and I'm showing you this space maker, um, a project that, that was generated um, um, using uh, space maker AI. Space maker has since been um, uh, um, bought up by Autodesk for $240 million. Uh, Autodesk clearly thinks this is the way forward. And what I want to suggest is this might look very conventional. And it is very conventional in terms of its architecture. Uh, but what is revolutionary is the way this technique has been used. I don't think SpaceMaker is as advanced as the work of XCool because it doesn't use so much deep learning, but nonetheless, it's doing something interesting. So this project, which um, was done by not by SpaceMaker um, as architects, they would they just provide the the the, the AI software as well. But um, this was gives them a clue about it. But what I found interesting was the discussion we had between um, her and Harvard Hawkland, um, that where they were kind of Harvard, Harvard Hawkland was, was was making some comments about the shock that he you know, had when uh, the AI was able to produce something that no expert would have predicted, uh, and yet it was a very good solution. Um, and this was unnerving that AI could operate and um, at a level beyond human perception. No architect would come up with it, and yet, yet it produced certain solutions that were actually were extremely efficient. And I think when you're thinking about architecture. Um, you're thinking maybe about sort of a, a, especially urban design. You're thinking about two different issues. One is the the um, strategic approach, the kind of question of how do you fit something within the site according to the certain constraints. And it's uh, urban situations are immensely complicated. And if you can use the AI to to, to work with the data at a level beyond which humans can operate, the, the second part is of course the question about aesthetics, about what things look like. Um, and that also potentially is a domain in which AI can, can be very significant because once it understands what we like, and it already does in terms of, let's say, music from Spotify or movies um, uh, or, or, or the books, Amazon will recommend books based on our data, as it were. Uh, once it recognizes our, our, our aesthetic preferences, then that will be the next step, as it were. But this project was one uh, which actually was uh, articulated that, that quite a question. It, it brought, came up with a solution that was counterintuitive. It was not what architects would have thought about, but it proved to be the best solution. Now, that's the first comment that I think uh, is important um, that Harvard Hawkins came up with. But then this is the, 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 the most important comment of everything in the book. You know, frankly, um, this is the one that everybody should pay attention to. And, and it's not something that it's something that surprised me. But the more I think about it, the more I realize this is the real game changer. In other words, de developers want to actually ask their architects to use AI. Um, it's a requirement from the clients. Now, it may be SpaceMaker, it might be X Tools work or whatever. You, you've got to ask the question, well, why are they asking that? Why, why are clients asking their architects to use AI? And the answer is fairly obvious. It's because they can use AI to guarantee their return on investment, uh, their ROI, as it's called, that you can you, ROI, you can you can um, optimize if we could use that term, the potential of a site. You can optimize the performance of a building by using AI. And um, but the point is, that the clients say, "I want you to use this." You know, I, I and use that has implications. That has implications because eventually you begin to sort of worry that actually. We don't need architects because AI can produce something better than any architect can produce and it will guarantee the return on investment. So the architect's still there, but you know, the question is for how much longer? Um, so um, this is, brings me to the second part, uh, the final part of the lecture, which I'm looking at the dark side, the black side. So the, the, the Vlad the Impaler side. Um, this is the early design. Actually, the, the text, the title on the right hand side is wrong. It's not the title. It's simply that they were just knocking it up. But uh, so where the first one, the white cover is already out. The other one is in the process of being um, being written. And I know pretty much what I'm going to say. I just haven't got around to writing. This is the title, The Death of the Architect. And it's not necessarily and what it's saying is not necessarily that AI is the only thing that's that's really challenging the architectural profession right now. There are many, many other aspects. And let me let me simply sort of say that as someone who translated Alberti, Alberti um, was the person who gave us the uh, understanding of the architect um, as the person in charge, operating in charge of the whole thing. And 
Alberti famously comments that it's not the workman I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the workman. The workman or the work person, shall we say, is but a tool in the hand of the architect. And he defines the architect as, in, it comes from the ancient Greek, it means the chief person, as in archangel. The architect is a chief person, and that was the definition that Alberti gave us. Well, what's already happened, and with, with or without AI, is that the architect is no longer the chief person. In, in the UK, at any rate, most projects are run by developers. In other words, instead of, the, instead of the, the work person being a tool in the hand of the architect, the architect is now a tool in the hand of the developer. So already architecture has been is struggling. And of course, we know that only 5% of buildings are designed by architects. All I'm saying here effectively is AI is going to be the final nail in the coffin to some extent, shall we say, of architecture. But what I'm saying is not that AI is evil. It's, it's just a tool. No tool is evil. Um, I mean, a kitchen knife, you can, um, you can um, slice up vegetables, you can also murder someone with it. Rather, it's the very potential of AI that um, is so terrifying. So the yin-yang sign, which where the, the black has white in it and the, and the white has black in it, I, my view is, is, that, is that already we can see the danger of AI because it is so good. It's so terrifyingly good. And this is a, a moment when I realized what was happening. It's actually a, a friend of mine, uh, last week flew to Milan for Milan Fashion Week and she experienced the same thing and it, it, this is a kind of holy shit moment right I mean I'm boarding a flight if this is Los Angeles International Airport and I somehow sensed what was going to happen actually um, and I came along with my boarding pass you know a bit of paper and uh, I was kind of presenting it to the flight attendant and the flight attendant said no I don't don't I don't need that just just look at this screen so I looked at this screen and there's me taking a photograph of the screen. And suddenly it, it, it tells me my seat. Now, I was terrified at this moment. It recognized me from every single other person on the planet. It recognized me from every other single person on the planet. And it told me my seat. And that is what I mean by how terrifying AI is, it can be. Now, of course, governments can use it. You know, you can use the tool in a very negative way um, or a positive way. You know, I, I, I'm not going to say that it's not. And surveillance has both good and bad, um, but it's not the tool. I always say a bad workman, a bad theorist blames the tool. You know, a bad workman blames the tool. A bad theorist blames the tool. You have to look at the affordance. It's a much more complicated question from a theoretical perspective the affordance of possibilities, but there's nothing that you can't say that that AI will, uh, that, that a kitchen knife will cause a someone to be murdered. Um, that's called technological determinism. There are many ways in which you use technology. It's a question of who uses it and how. So, um, but the potential of what it could do was very clear over time because there were a series of kind of high profile moments, which were really cynical marketing exercises, to be honest, because companies like IBM wanted people to invest in their company and they had to stage these events just to show the, the world what it could do in popular terms. And there've been various moments when these kind of um, uh, branding moments have, have happened this happened in 1997, um, and it was the moment that everyone had been predicting. Um, uh, the Ray Kurzweil said it would happen by 2000. It happened actually in 1997. It was the moment when the world chess champion and one of the greatest world chess champions of all time, I'd say, Gary Kasparov, was beaten by IBM's um, deep blue computer. Um, and here he is with his with his with his his head in his hands um, in 19 moves, I think it was game two, um, he was beaten. And he came up with this kind of comment at the bottom. Everything we know how to do, machines will do better. Um, and he's right, I think. Um, it's only a question of time. Um, but the really important moment, and this is what I would refer to as the Sputnik moment, um, in terms of the development of AI happened in 2016 when um, AlphaGo, which was a, a system that was developed by DeepMind in London, Dennis Osabis is the uh, genius in a way behind that, along with others. Um, a company, the company is now owned by Google, but um, <clears throat> DeepMind or, um, or AlphaGo took on Lisa Doll, the 
the one of the world's greatest ever uh, Go players. Now, it's one thing to play chess, but chess is quite straightforward. Um, uh, Go, even though the moves are straightforward, and I never played Go, so I don't know, but um, it has, it's infinitely complicated because there are more potential moves in Go than there are atoms in the universe. And you know, it, there are more potential moves in Go than there are atoms in the universe. And what that means is that they can't simply rely on straightforward uh, expert systems. You can't just train a system to do this because it would, it would be impossible. You literally could not complete the training. So what they basically have are these now needs new learning systems, learning systems that can learn and therefore operate in a far more efficient sort of way. And this is the example of, of deep learning and what it can do. Um, and it wasn't so much, and here is that it wasn't so much the fact that it beat the, the world champion. It wasn't so much it could take on a game as as potentially complex as Go. What was interesting was the way in which it did it. And, and most famously, there is something that came out, uh, something that's become a, a kind of within the world of AI, a very famous moment, which is going to say, move 37. This is the black stone that was part of that. Move 37 in game two where everybody thought this was a mistake because you don't put your stone in the early games in, on the fifth line. You put it either this line or this line. And, and what was it doing? Well, what happened actually is, and, and they thought it was a mistake, but only later did they realize the strategic brilliance of this move because a hundred moves later, these stones over here joined up with this one and the game was won. Now, human beings, um, uh, we they go players play work by by intuition when they they work from one move to another. The idea that potentially uh, AI could be operating a hundred moves ahead, and I don't think it was quite like that. But anyway, the way that it can be operating that way is astonishing. Um, it's operating beyond the level we can really understand, beyond the level of which of human comprehension is, and it's producing moves that. Um, uh, I don't know if I use the word creative. This is another discussion, right, about the moves. But um, this is a comment that Lisa Doll made. AlphaGo showed us that moves humans may have thought are creative were actually conventional. Um, and the problem, of course, being that humans couldn't recognize it. Humans could not recognize how creative, how capable AI could be. And um, I take the view, ultimately, that AI is... Um, it's a bit like those of you who have dogs. You know that dogs have got a greater sense of smell or hearing than human beings. Um, I think that in terms of the spectrum of, of intelligence, the bandwidth that, that we humans occupy is a very narrow bandwidth, and I think that, that AI is off the uh, off the other end. Um, anyway, but if anyone thought that was impressive, the next step was the really astonishing one, where they produced the next generation. So AlphaGo Zero was the next generation. Um, and this played against um, AlphaGo, the original one, um, and it beat it 100 games to zero. That just completely, completely thrashed it. Um, but it wasn't that so much that was so impressive. Rather, there were two factors. One, it wasn't taught the game, the, the rules of the game of Go. Nobody gave AlphaGo the rules. It worked out what the rules were by itself. And the second most important other thing about it, uh, which is truly, truly astonishing, um, is the fact that the, the speed at which it was working um, in terms of um, it used reinforcement learning. Um, and it re used reinforcement learning, which is kind of a reward system that allows it to train itself. And it played 4.9 million games of Go over three days. Now, 4.9 million, three days, you think, oh, that's a lot. But when you really think about what it means, it is even more astonishing. Now, this is a hummingbird being slowed down. Um, and I, it, it's probably beating its wings on this video at about two beats per second, um, roughly that. What AlphaGo was doing was playing a game of Go against itself. It was playing 20 games of Go per second. 20 games of Go per second. In other words, it was playing a game of Go 10 times as fast as this. Um, and that is is just something we can't even comprehend. We cannot comprehend how the 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 operations that are going on. Um, this is a wake up call. Now, um, I think importantly, this is our this is our real Achilles' heels because we can't imagine how smart AI is. And and this is a discussion. I think it's a very important discussion. Jack Ma, 
makes this incredibly stupid comment. Human beings can never create another thing that is smarter than human beings. Well, no. Anybody who's been working at the cutting edge will know that um, that, that uh, these are the comments of the reply by Elon Musk. I, I very much disagree with that. The biggest mistake I see people making is to assume they're smart. People underestimate the capability of AI. They sort of think it's like a smart human, but it's going to be much smarter than the smartest human you will ever know. And Elon Musk is right, Jack Ma is wrong. It'll be, and we won't even understand how smart it is. We will not know how smart it is. We won't know how creative it is. It'll be operating beyond um, beyond our comprehension. This is called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And, and basically that's, this says that the, the dumb don't know how dumb they are because they're just stupid. The stupid don't know how stupid they are. But you could say the intelligent don't know how stupid they are. Or you could say the creative don't know, the creative people don't know how uncreative they are. In other words, there's another, another level at which we can operate. And this is what I think is so terrifying. Now, the very big, uh, so I think, to my mind, we have to go through a second Copernican revolution, just as Nicholas Copernicus had told us that actually the world, that the, the world, the earth was not the center of the universe, rather the earth was going around the sun. We have to realize that we human beings are not the center of the universe. Uh, there are forms of intelligence out there that are going to far exceed us. We have to recognize that, frankly, if we all die out from COVID, the world will go on without us. We're not that important. Um, so we need to really rethink our position in the world. Um, so if there's another model that I want to introduce to, to, to show the potential of AI, so on the left-hand side, Alpha, go on the right-hand side, the self-driving car. And the self-driving car is very interesting for different sort of reasons. Um, this is a comment made by um, Toby Walsh, who produced a book called, wrote a book called Machines That Think. Well, Machines Can't Think, by the way, but it's a bad title, but never mind. Um, and he makes this comment which I think is really, really astonishing. Um, we won't be allowed to drive cars anymore and we will not notice or even care. We won't be allowed to drive cars anymore and we will not notice or even care. The argument is this, basically, we will discover, I think I've got the next one in my next, no, okay. Um, we, 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 the, the argument is this, we will discover that uh, self-driving cars eventually, it's very soon, I mean, they're already to some extent, um, Tesla are self-driving cars anyway, but we'll soon discover as technology improves um, at an exponential rate, um, uh, we will discover that um, that it's, it's very convenient to use these, these, these things, to, to self-driving cars, especially Uber and so on, it'll be self-driving, no question. Um, and we will therefore use them more and more. We will use self-driving cars because they're so convenient. You know, if we're going, you know, go out for a drink in the evening, going to a restaurant, we'll get a self-driving car to take us back home or something, a, a taxi or something. You know, we will use it. And we will gradually, as a result, lose some of our driving skills. We won't drive so much. And because we lose some of our driving skills, the insurance premiums will go up. It'll become more expensive to drive. And eventually it becomes so expensive, you'll think, ah, what the hell? Um, I'm just going to use a self-driving car, and so the prediction is that we will be, um, we will, we will be so dangerous because we can't drive properly, and it'll be too expensive. So we'll just use self-driving cars, and we won't notice or care. This is the most important fact: we won't notice or care. So um, at the beginning, um, uh, Augustine introduced me uh, with the discussion about the singularity. Actually, I don't think the singularity is a very good, a very clever term because it speaks about a singular singularity and the prediction that Ray Kurzweil makes that is all of a sudden we're going to reach a time when there's going to be an explosion of intelligence because as intelligent machines machines start kind of producing in themselves intelligent machines there's going to be an explosion and we're going to be left behind that's the theory of uh of the singularity um I don't think it's going to happen like that already at all for for example already it's very differential. In other words, there are certain areas where AI is better than us, chess and go clearly, right? And some areas where we're still better, right? So there isn't going to be a singular singularity any case. It's just simply going to be um, uh, a series of different incremental approaches. Um, the way that the future happens is in a much more um, less dramatic way. In fact, um, my I actually have a doctoral student who uh, has a Tesla, and he told me, announced me one day that uh, 
his car had become self-driving. And uh, <clears throat> I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, yeah, I've just had a, soft, a software update. The way that cars become self-driving is through incremental change, incremental creep um, until it gradually, so you don't notice it. And so this is something I've discussed with Daniel Bollinger a lot, actually, the idea of um, boiling a frog. Um, no, I don't, I've never boiled a frog. I'm not recommending anyone boils a frog. And it's just a metaphor, a way to describe things. But the story is this, that if you want to boil a frog, you don't boil a, a, a pan of water and a saucepan of water and drop a frog in it because the, drop, the frog will just jump out, right? It, it'll get the shock jump out. What you do is you put the frog in a, a, a saucepan of, of, of lukewarm water and you gradually heat up the temperature and the frog doesn't notice the difference. Now, this is an important phenomenon. We often don't notice the difference. Um, let me just simply say, when I was a student, I was I studied in Cambridge, and I recall what it was like in those days, you know, back in the 80s. Um, uh, you know, I would I would go, go on, a on a trip somewhere, and I'd go to a travel agent. I'd queue up, and I'd wait for my turn, and I would, and then they would post my ticket to me by mail. Um, and then I would go to a camera shop and I would buy reels of films to take with me. And then when I came back, I would take these reels of films and I'd have them processed in a processing unit. <clears throat> None of that happens anymore. We, we buy our tickets online. There are a few travel agents less, but left, but most of them have gone. <clears throat> most camera shops have, have, have shut because we have cameras in our, our phones. Um, and we certainly don't process our films anymore. We all operate digitally. So, um, <clears throat> And we didn't notice it. We never really noticed it, but all those things have all disappeared. So, and that's what's going to happen. I think it's going to be a gradual process. So when you take an Uber, well, you already, you already dial into the, when you, when you order an Uber or these other um, hailing apps, um, you already tell, tell Uber where you want to go. You put the address in. Um, so you have to ask, why do you need a driver? Because you already, told and it's nice to have a chat with a driver um <clears throat> but you don't need the driver um and you also have to ask the questions are the same not going to happen with architecture you no know, it's, it's nice to have an architect have a chat with an architect but it's going to be an expensive chat it's going to be an expensive uber if you have a, a human driver there just to chat with you so this is i think how the future is going to happen um so this is the question we won't be allowed to design buildings anymore and we will not even notice or care. Um, the point being, it's all in that comment by Harvard Hoekland. AI will guarantee the best solution soon. Um, so why do you need an architect? You just, AI will do it. And clients will want, want the cheapest option. They will go straight to AI and they'll get their solution for that. So that's the proposition. We, will not, we won't be allowed, to be allowed to design buildings anymore and we will not even no notice or care. At the moment, I'm doing a book with Daniel Bolojan. It's called Learning from AlphaGo. And it's the, this year is the 50th, 50th anniversary of Learning from Las Vegas, which I find a particularly stupid book, I've got to say. I mean, it's absolutely nothing in it. Uh, and it's full of pictures. And it's got the most abhorrent sexist image of a woman um, <clears throat> uh, being used to promote uh, uh, sun, sun, suntan lotion on the front. Um, I don't know why people even bother buying this book, but it's still on the best seller, seller list. Uh, anyway, the point being that 50 years after learning from Las Vegas, um, there'll be a book called Learning from AlphaGo. When you hurt myself, Daniel Bolojan, and a fourth person who hopefully can be writing it. Um, and my point being that we will, that AI will transform architecture in a far more radical way than Las Vegas ever did. So forget learning from Las Vegas. It's a question of learning from AlphaGo. And so what happened to Lisa Doll? In, uh, Lisa Doll was beaten by AlphaGo um, four games to one in 2016. Um, it was a match that transformed the game of Go. It was a match that made uh, China and, and Korea really pay attention to AI. Um, in 2019, Lisa Doll retires, retires from the game of Go. And he says, this is an entity that cannot be defeated. AI is an entity that cannot be defeated. Lisa Doll retires. Is that, is that a, a kind of a, a, a ominous presage of the future of architecture? 
Is that what's going to happen to architecture? So this is why the second book came out, the kind of Vlad the Impaler, the black one, as it were. <clears throat> and the point being is that, you know, we started off, the architect um, uh, was defined by Alberti um, and by a curious coincidence, AI will, AI will effectively bring that moment in many ways to an end, arguably. Um, and the irony is, of course, that the, that the word, the name Alberti begins with a, a, a and ends in I. The name Alberti begins with A and ends in I. Game over. Will it be game over? Um, I, I don't think it will be completely game over. I, I, um, I gave a, a talk about this in, uh, in the Bartlett a few months ago, and I called it Squid Game. Um, I call it Squid Game because Squid Game is also Korean, but I think AlphaGo, which took place in Korea, was such an important match in many ways. Um, but it's not the end, right? I mean, even the self-driving car is not the end of what's happening on the left-hand side. People, you know, you know, going to a wedding with a, a horse and cart and uh, or a funeral or something. We still do that. Now, we, we've got these things now. I mean, not everybody, very few people, in fact. Why would you why would you have a horse and cart? Well, because you you for special ceremonies, you want to have something special. You then rent out these very expensive things just to go and mark that occasion. So my view in terms of architecture is that we will still have the star architects, maybe not Zaha herself, but we'll still have the star architects. And it'll be a bit like you know, having an expensive brand name handbag or <clears throat> handbag or, or clothing, Prada or Gucci. The point about Prada or Gucci is not to save money. It's, the point is to say you don't care about money. You don't care about money. You bought this expensive handbag and you've kind of branded yourself in that sort of way. And the same will happen with architects. You know? Of course, you get AI to produce something that is much, much more efficient, more, more optimal, whatever. Um, but you'll still want to have a star architect, a personal um, attention, like a you know personal trainer in a gym or something like that. You'll still want that. So let me finish with this um, from the, uh, the, uh, the AD on the machine hallucinations, uh, Edward Hyman, um, uh, the Infinity Skyscraper, which um, it's just one of many examples of what's coming out at the moment um, right now. Um, what I want to sum up, what I'm trying to say is that we are at a particular threshold moment in this year, 2022, when I predict that we will suddenly realize what's going to, what's happening in terms of, of AI. We will realize that it's going to be <clears throat> the Sputnik moment, the Bilbao moment or something like that. Um, and we will be astonished by what's coming out and these books will all appear. And these books, they take three years to produce, to get a contract. So it's not as though they have, we haven't been thinking about it for a while, but all of a sudden they will appear in the bookshop in the next five months. There will be five new books all appearing and people will start talking about these things. When you host a project that I couldn't show today, that will become public knowledge and we will look back at it and say, oh, that happened back in March 2022. That's old fashioned now. The world is changing. Theoretically, there's new debates about the theory of intelligence is coming out of neuroscience and AI that's going to transform architectural theory as well. I have no question about that. We have a journal that's coming out in June um, that Philip Yuan and I are launching um, called Architectural Intelligence. We produced a book uh, last year called Architectural Intelligence, now a journal. And the point being that all architecture will be intelligent. These techniques will be used throughout architecture to make sure that we have the optimal structures, um, the optimal performance in terms of our buildings, we will be using these tools throughout. This is, in many ways, the Sputnik moment, the, 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 the moment when the things were going to change. So it's, it's, it's a, it, the mixture of good and bad. Um, it is both exhilarating what is happening, it's astonishing what's happening, um, but it's terrifying at the same point. And I'll leave it at that because I think uh, so the country of Vlad the Impaler, you guys like this, the dark side of things. Um, but um, let me let me leave it at that. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm happy to take some questions. Um, and it's still early morning here in in uh, in, um, in LA. It's, it's eight thirty, so so I, I can stick around if you want to. Up to you. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask a question. And uh, before I ask it, I would I would like to give some context. Uh, and uh, I would ask you to look at uh, BIM, uh, yeah. BIM uh, modeling, and how uh, for the last uh, few years BIM has have been marketed uh, 
uh, as a revolutionary tool and it it still feels like at least this is my perception it still feels like it is uh, going through a really slow start and at least regarding mass adoption and uh, things are uh, uh, i think things are even worse regarding computational design on um, the level of expertise and the level of uh, mass adoption uh, uh, and the contribution of, of computational design to the bulk of uh, architectural projects in the world is still very low. Um, is there any reason why AI design tools will not become this uh, next even more exclusionary uh, uh, thing that uh, we will have a hard time to um, adopt on the market? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, <clears throat> uh, first of all, we're all using AI. I mean, if you've got Gmail account, it's, you know, it's telling you how your sentences end, you know, so it's not as though it's exclusionary at the moment. It's everywhere, literally everywhere. We might not realize it, but it's literally everywhere. So it is already there. Now, I take your point about exclusionary, and I think that, that it's definitely the case that, you know, there are some places in the world where not only can they not afford computers, but frankly, they don't have the um, the the, the, the data is very expensive. I was we had a session about Africa, and apparently it's really expensive just even to run a computer in, in 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 certain countries in Africa. So it is there is a kind of digital divide. There's no question about that. And it, it uh, I guess my message is kind of addressed more to the um, <clears throat> the slightly privileged, um, well not just the Western world, but actually also a place like China. I mean, this is really um, having an impact. <clears throat> what I will say though, and this is something I didn't touch upon, but because I haven't got time, but um, BIM will, will go out of fashion. Um, this is the project that um, that Wan Yu He is working on. There's a, there's a the, the, the platform they're producing is called ABC, um, and it, it, the problem is that BIM is is a kind of separate thing. You think about the way that some of the office like Zaha works. You know, there's a they do Maya models, you know, beautiful Maya models, models, and they you know that's fine. But you've got to go and do a Rhino model of that. Then you've got a, a BIM model of that, and then you've got a whatever. What we're going to get is an integrated platform, and BIM is going to be out of fashion um, because it'll go straight from data to the to the design. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, what I uh, let me just say that, that it, it the, the what I'm presenting is is really about um, certain societies where um, that are more affluent. Shall we say? I'm also I'm also exaggerating things. You know, it's a deliberate strategy. I want you to pay attention to this. And there's actually Jean Baudrillard, the uh, the French. Uh, <clears throat> um, cultural theorists whom I write about in, in aesthetics of architecture, um, he had this tactic, he would call it fatal strategies, you know, he would exaggerate things, what he would talk about would be less a representation of reality than a transcendence of reality, but he would do this deliberately to say, listen, pay attention, you know, and I'm doing the same, I'm slightly exaggerating this. Um, and it's not going to be the death of all architects, right? I mean, <clears throat> in Squid Game, there's always one, there's always one architect, who, always one competitor who survives. But um, let me just say that, you know, look, according to Wan Yu, already we're in a situation by, whereby one person can do, one person with AI can do what five people can do without AI. So it's not a question of AI versus um, the uh, human beings, it's rather, it's rather human beings versus human beings with AI. And, 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 and the market will not sustain expensive practices. If someone could do it more cheaply and better using AI, that's what they're going to do. Um, but it, I think the point is that there are also, you could see, there are two ways of thinking about the, the AI revolution. I mean, there is a guy called Randy Deutsch who has a book called Super Users. And he, he kind of predicts that in the future of the architectural office, there'll be these incredibly advanced, um, computationally advanced people like, like Daniel Bolliger. I mean, that's the office of the future. It'll be, it'll be colonized by those kind of people. Well, actually, the opposite is also true. And the way that, that um, Space Maker like to think about their tools is actually, it's very accessible, very accessible. It's a bit like, you know, if you've got, a, you've got an iPhone, right? I mean, you can just swipe it, you know, and, or you can facial recognition. It uses advanced technology, but actually it makes it easier. And if you think about the shift that's happened from, I don't know, Claudia will know about this, but the shift that happens from the world when we were scripting things and kind of hacking into sort of, you know, uh, into Maya and so on. Actually, now with Grasshopper, you know, that's so much easier. I mean, um, and that's what's going to, so it can happen. There's going to be two ways in which it's going to operate. One, it's going to be so easy and so much easier, but then you will also need the Daniel Bollagens to kind of 
to look under the hood and to to to, to the experts who can understand these systems to to, to customize it towards your particular um, office. So I, you know, I I understand BIM is very clunky. It's very awkward. Um, maybe you just forget about BIM and move to the next stage. No, but anyway, that that's the prediction. I mean, I and I. I, I, I've got every confidence that it'll, that it'll happen. Um, so, but you know, it's not going to be the same everywhere. It's not going to be the same everywhere. Not everyone's going to be doing this. I can imagine there'll still be some very manual processes in some countries, in some places. Um, but when it comes to, I don't know, London, New York, and God knows where else, Shanghai, you know, Beijing, that's going to be different. Um, that's the prediction. I mean, who knows? Who knows? Well, let's wait and see. May yeah. I add something? Uh, sure. to the discussion, uh, don't you believe that with this um, envis envisioned uh, death of the architect um, will, will come a democratization of architecture? Um. Uh, for, for, for photos who will use these tools like space makers tools and the other side will be super users that will uh, Want to to with that will request the deep uh, deep my uh, deep uh, himoblau uh, yeah. tool to to design his very special building. So it'll be two categories, maybe. Well, I mean, depending on what you mean by democratization of architecture, I mean, first of all, um, it, you know, people will bypass the architect. I think you know, and I, there's nothing that the RIBA or the AIA or all these institutes can do because they're not even protecting architects right now. I mean, if only five percent of the buildings are designed by architects then don't expect them to save you, okay? Because they will go out of business because uh, AI doesn't need to be a member of the AIA or the RIBA, forget about it. Now that's, that, they'll be disappearing first of all. Um, <clears throat> but I think the real danger is, is frankly, and it's happening in a way that we don't even notice as architects, because as Rem Kool has sort of, you know, says we're looking at a microscope, at a, looking through a microscope at a footnote to the main text. That's what we're doing. You know, we're only 5% of buildings are designed by architects and we're looking at like, one percent of those five percent you know, we're ignoring all the rest so we don't notice certain things but there are going to be softwares that kind of come out that they're already here that you know you can redesign your 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 um extend your garden patio there's a software anyone can use it anyone can do that you know and so the architect's going to be well the little jobs like they're doing a kind of bathroom extension no we can anyone an ordinary person can do that soon so i wouldn't necessarily say it's going to be democratizing it depends how you want to put it right i mean it's going to be um I, think I, I imagine I imagine architects that will feed these softwares in the sense of uh, offering a high quality uh, um, response. Uh, they will they will feed the softwares in the sense that the, the softwares will be able to offer a high quality uh, response, uh, and they will be embedded in the software with their knowledge. Uh, and the afterwards, uh, the clients will uh, uh, or everyone will be able to use software. Uh, these softwares to to address certain uh, certain uh, projects, but we, uh, that project will be with a high uh, uh, level uh, quality. Yeah, but just think about this from the point of view of the architect. To begin, to, it is a, a gradual process. To begin with, we will have this tool that will be incredible. We'll think, wow, look what I can do with this, you know, and I can enter a competition, you know, to design a city with my AI, just me on my own, you know, and. And you'll think that's fantastic. And of course, to begin with, it will be fantastic. But then eventually, you know, it goes back to the self-driving car. You know, why would you want to have an Uber with a driver when you've already told the Uber car where to go? Why would you need an architect when they, that when, when, well, at the moment, as soon as you've got a self-driving car, you don't need a driver. As soon as you've got AI that can generate on its own, um, automatically, you don't need an architect. And I think this is actually a serious question. Um, and, uh, but anyway, I mean, it is going to be a gradual process and we're going to shift from one to the other. But <clears throat> I don't know if it, democratization would be, is the right word for it. But uh, um, and, and, you know, I, I think, you know, there, there are different approaches towards this. Some people say, listen, don't be scaremongering. It's, you know, it's not going to be like that. And in any case, but I mean, let's think about it. You know, uh, what happened to the horses when the car was invented? They, they went out of, out of, they're unemployed. I mean, you still have horses for show jumping and things, but. They, there was no job left for them. Um, and we're talking about this, we're talking about a system that learns. I mean, cars don't learn, but but these these systems learn. So whatever situation we're in, it's going to get kind of worse. Anyway, I'm just, I'm, I'm being provocative, right? But uh, I want you guys to pay attention to this because it's there. It's, 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 
the, the writing is on the wall. The writing's on the wall. Maybe a democratized access to architecture. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I mean, exactly, exactly. Maybe, maybe. I don't know if it is a demo. I mean, you know, I don't know. During the lockdown, yeah. I discovered that actually, I don't know, my haircut wasn't very really good, but you could buy a, a, you could cut your hair yourself, or at least my partner cuts my hair. You know, so it, hairdressers going out of fashion, you know, I don't know. But uh, um, yes, uh, I, it, I don't think democratization is quite the right word. Um, but, uh, but, um, yeah, I mean it's the same thing. Frankly, you know, you or you you is does does ordering flights online does that democratize um, travel? I mean, yes, to some extent. Access to access to traveling. <laughs> I, I imagine uh, everyone uh, being able to 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 design a house um, and uh, a house that otherwise wouldn't have access to an architect. As you say, five percent uh, 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 allow themselves to 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 access an architect. So um, these tools will uh, off, uh, will uh, will enrich uh, uh, the the quality of architecture because uh, they offer the possibility to to everyone to to engage with these tools <laughs> in a sense. Yeah. Well. Anyway. No, I, yes, I, I, yeah, exactly. Well, sort of. I wouldn't say democratization, but I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. So sorry to interrupt, but you have to agree at some point that now in the world, the, the amount of high quality architecture is like basically almost equal to the the, the richest one percent, right? We have the superstars, and we have some what we call maybe one percent superstar, maybe five percent decent architects, and then everything else it's something else, right? Uh, which which is interesting. For example, imagine having now we are playing with the, the, the deep uh, human blog and maybe some kind of deep Zaha networks. But imagine in a very near future that you'll have a system that will be able to design it, not only to combine to create some kind of Zaha like or to some kind of blog like uh, form, but actually to create uh, a very thousand minds exactly. of architects <laughs> not, in the not, same well, network. You have two options. Let's say first you can you can get the Zaha network first, and then you can combine them. But that's a different, like a second layer. But even the, the Zaha system, right? Of course, it will yield something that is Zaha-like, right? It will create Zaha-like designs. However, those Zaha-like designs, if they are also informed with the urban context, if they're informed with, the, with all of the parameters that the human mind can never do, including Zaha and including the studio itself, right? It will be able to create things that are very, very interesting. I think. And those interesting things will be available not to everyone, maybe because you still have the computational power and you still have a difference between big studios affording more more GPUs and more more cloud space than than smaller studios. So you still have to to, to fight or, or pay for the uh, let's say the computational level that you will be able to afford as a company, but it will still potentially bring higher quality architecture to the masses in, in a sense. I'm not saying that everybody should be should be building Zaha like uh, things because because again the strategic discussion is a separate one. But when it comes to, first of all, solving the problem of, of let's say, everything having to do with optimization, by the way, what, what you showed from X, uh, X school and also some of the other things are not necessarily the same application of AI. It's called multi-objective optimization, so it's a little bit different. But still, being able to, to, to comprehend so many so many parameters in their, well, let's say, like in their minds, it's definitely going to kick any, any human's ass, and even uh, groups of humans will be completely left, to, let's say, uh, non-competitive because the complexity of what one of these networks will be able to do in a matter of years i think will let, let everyone mostly mesmerized in front of it like listed all right you'll say fuck this is an amazing <laughs> move I, I never saw that design in this case right i never imagined that uh, stuff so yes we'll be mesmerized but in in a sense now the, the go game in, in itself has, has reached a new level right, right? The, the fact that, that these networks will be able to in, in metaphorically play 4,000 design uh, games in, internally and come up with something amazing will have to revolutionize the world in the, the sense, right? So we could expect in a way that the world as, as a whole will, will benefit from be better design results. I think this is what Andrea is trying to say, not necessarily democratizing the fact that one family can afford to, to have a design that otherwise they wouldn't have access to, but normally the quality of the design should, should increase overall, right? And it, it, it should be better. I'm not sure exactly if you agree with this or not, Yes, yes, this was what I meant. So, so let me just say that I, you know, um, maybe what I didn't make clear, and this is something that um, Daniel was always arguing about, is basically, 
if you just take Zaha, you can you can use style GANs and it will interpolate. It's a kind of averaging of something. You know, it only comes out of what you put in there. But then once you, you, you realize you could use cycle GANs where you basically are breeding, you're pairing off one data set against another, you could use Zaha and orchids or something, you know, and out of that would be an extrapolation of something that is that is really um, unusual and different for sure. But I want to just kind of just since I mean, I don't know if you guys know, but Claudio is a very good jazz player. Um, and uh, oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not a jazz player, but... <laughs> no, no, but but well, maybe not professionally, but uh, but still. And I just wanted to say, I always think that, you know, we always think we're incredibly creative as architects. We think, oh, this can't be as creative as us at all. Um, but if you think about what happens in a studio, you know, I think it's a bit like jazz because, you know, what we're doing, we, we've got just... a certain pattern and we're playing off against that pattern. You know, when you're producing a design in the studio, it's an example I always give. If, if, you, if you produce a building that looks like a, like a, like a, um, a pineapple, someone will say, that's not architecture, you, you idiot. You know, what, what are you doing? What are you studying architecture for? But if you do something that's kind of a little bit like Zaha, but not quite the same, a little bit like Rem Koolhaas, but not like quite the same, or or or, or whatever, Jan Sommar or, or Cor Pimmelblau, that's architecture. So in other words, you've got a situation whereby you you know, actually, we're not that creative because you've got to be close enough to the canon of architecture and just offer a slight variation. In fact, there's a there's a there's an there's an art there's an AI person who, uh, called Ahmed Gamal who does recognize that. And he looks at he generates um, generates um, AI paintings, as it were, AI art. Where well, he does the same thing. He he recognizes the can and then pushes it slightly further. It's called creative gans, you know. So that's what we're doing. And if you think about it, also um, uh, we 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 copy. You know, we we just copy the whole time. It's how culture spreads. You know, we see someone who's wearing Nike sneakers and we go and buy a pair, or whatever. Someone in the studio is doing and someone else is kind of copying it. that's it's called memes so we all effectively copy and it's part of how culture propagates itself but even when you have a game-changing um situation whereby um somebody uh, like frank gary the guggenheim and bilbao i think was it was a game changer but then frank gary replicates himself and the disney concert hall in la is very similar to to um the to guggenheim and bilbao uh, and the way i see architects has really been very constrained by their own signatures um what i mean i mean not just signatures like writing your name but also the way that you walk where you talk you repeat certain behaviors and certain patterns <clears throat> i i can recognize someone who, who from 100 meters away by the way they walk or run or, or swim or surf or you know i can recognize in their voice and so on we're a bit like pieces on a chessboard you know we we only operate in certain sort of ways you know um you know, a, 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 a castle can only go one direction, a, a, a bishop, back, you know, and so on. Each of us are constrained in many ways by, you know, my own limitations. So that's the way I see, and that's our, our problem. The question is when you, when you get AI that uh, is so capable, whether we will recognize how good it is. It's got to be so close. To, if we, we all won't see it, uh, but I, I've already mentioned that. So it, it's going to be interesting for sure. I would like to uh, ask another thing. Uh, do you think? Uh, do you can you imagine a, a reason or a, a, some kind of threat that could trigger the next AI winter? Um, I was. I uh, no, I can't personally. Um, I I can't personally. I mean, just to say, the AI winters uh, are moments when. Um, AI doesn't live up to its predictions. And, and part of the problem of that in terms of the history of AI is that in order to get funding, you say, oh, I can do this. And, and, and of course, it failed in many ways. And they had lots of problems. Um, uh, I will go into the, 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 some of them are quite comical, some of the problems they had. But I think from 2006 onwards with the deep learning revolution, um, we've, uh, things have opened up and, and we're able to do things that we just hadn't imagined. So. I, I personally don't think we're ever going to have another winter, um, but uh, but who knows? Um, no, I, I I think now it's it's become the public has begun to recognise that, and and, and that it's it's a self propagating system because everyone's so fascinated by what it can do. They're exploring it, and the more they're they're exploring it, the more it's potential. 
So I can't see an AI winter as such that th there are certain obstacles that we're still looking at, right? And uh, uh, we, we can't operate in, in, in 3D, so I'm going to uh, 3D very well. So um, uh, let me just stop sharing. Um, and um, <clears throat> sorry, um, we, we can't, op there are many things we can't do so well. So, I mean, I think, uh, um, <clears throat> I think that, um, It'll it'll be a question of time. How 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 soon we get to that point when um, we can do all these things? It, it, there's a, a theory called Moore's law, which is not actually doesn't actually work. But the Moore's law started off by saying that everything gets um, halves in price over two years and, and gets the double the, the 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 power as it were, the capability. And that's not necessarily holding true. It can't hold true forever. But that's pretty much the way it goes. So. It's a bit like the way that COVID spreads. You know, it's kind of exponential the way these things happen. It's not, it's not one, two, three, four. It's one, two, four, eight, sixteen. Um, and I'm always astonished by how quickly all these things happen. Um, they're speeding up effectively, um, and that's why my books are out of fact, uh, out of out of date before they're published. And they, they you almost like you want to have a, a kind of book like a Google Doc where you can kind of update it on a daily basis to keep pace with these things because, um, yeah. Um, Anyway, I'm rambling. Sorry. No, but it's an interesting. Just one mention. I think the reason for for uh, the reason that another let's say AI winter won't exist is that AI itself won't allow it to happen. Because the moment we have AI writing code, AI developing itself, from that point on, we're completely left out of the equation, and that that would ensure that it be maybe be a human <laughs> AI uh, winter, but not the AI winter itself, right? To me, the best reference also for the students in in this um, in this uh, conference, I think. Uh, looking at the movie her which is one of the i think is one of the best <laughs> one of the most beautiful and optimistic way in which ai will interact with humanity we will simply be too too simple too stupid and too let's say too time consuming for them to for, for the ais to to actually um give up <laughs> for proverbial fuck about us and that's the, the easiest and the most beautiful way the other ones i also advise you to look ex machina and other movies where uh where the the AI, ai is actually learning how to manipulate perfectly our emotions and to the, emulate them and then to to actually then manipulate humanity without any any trace of um, empathy and any trace of remorse or anything it's just a pragmatic let's say problem that they solve and in the most pragmatic way that's the that's the dangerous part right the the, the, the part where they actually develop emotions which is more or less what the her uh, looks uh, shows that's the beautiful part that, that it will be we'll be lucky to get <laughs> to that point where we simply become obsolete let's say simply or simpletons right and there's, of course, the, the singularity theory where actually the only way to prevent that from happening, so us becoming obsolete, is to integrate ourselves with AI, right? Which is, uh, again, another reason for the AI's, uh, let's say, winter not to come. I mean, what Elon Musk is trying to do now with his uh, Neuralink and all of that is kind of stepping in that direction. Could we afford ourselves to be left as simpletons in, in the AI? And what you said during the conference was really true. Uh, the biggest mistake we can do as humans uh, versus AI is to trust our, uh, let's say, intuition. It will never work with complex systems, and also assume that the human brain is the model to go for, which is another <laughs> mistake, right? Because then we'll create people like selfish AIs and all of the other problems that have unlimited AI, right? And the, the, the actual moment that an AI system, like a high-level AI system, will be as smart as a human, will be one zero point zero 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 one millisecond. The next millisecond, it will be, or nanosecond, it will be twice as smart, right? So we, we have to be wary of the fact that we're talking about exponential scale, not at a human or evolutionary scale that we're used to on, on Earth, but we are talking about artificial evolution, which will have no boundary other than the one that it sets to itself, right? So that's the danger here. Not And, and the winter, it will be for us mostly <laughs> if we don't, Converge with the AI, I think. That's... So that, I mean, let me just say, I mean, I think the movie, I, I think Blade Runner is the movie, right? I mean, oh, yeah, okay, but that's... Um, so I mean, uh, what um, what Blade Runner? So so what's interesting about Blade Runner is it kind of because it's all I, I'm in LA, right? So it's kind of like that's the city where it was set. Um, but there are three there are three models that are kind of interesting actually. It's not just and Blade Runner are not, they're not, they're, 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 they're biologic, they're kind of, they're not AI as such, but they're clearly sort of artificial life forms. Um, and it's kind of interesting, the kind of the comparison between that and AI, because it's a bit like the Turing test to recognize these things. There's, you have to have a special test, the volt Kampf test. I don't know if you've seen the movie, but the first one was astonishing. And, 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 
so so there's that model but the other one i always like to mention is is um so blade runner was set the the 19th 21st of um november 2019 so two years ago and and of course elon musk brought out the cyber truck um on that date and the cyber truck is based on one of the cars that appeared in the movie <clears throat> but what's interesting is also is the um the the fact that the two days before that 17th of of, of november 2019 that was when uh, COVID was first found. And if you think about COVID, you also have to test it because you can't see it. So they're a bit like replicants and they kind of become um, uh, as dangerous in some ways. So I think these are kind of models. So, but I definitely think Blade Runner is the one to go for, especially as I think that uh, Refik Anadol was so inspired by, um, by, by, by Blade Runner itself. So, um, uh, but anyway, yes, you're right. It's, it's a kind of speculative future. I just want to say that I put into the, the chat um, a discussion um, uh, and maybe you could um, uh, pass that on. Um, I don't know how you can do this, but to this, <clears throat> to, to this, this series of, dis the, of the discussions, we, we had a discussion yesterday. Uh, and and um, actually, the interesting thing was that, that uh, I, I, while I like Jeff Hawkins, I think he's wrong because he tries to model AI on the human brain. I think it's the other way around. We've got to learn from AI about how how we operate in the mirror of AI. But but still, I mean, he's, he's very adamant about that um and if you want to follow him then have a look at the the link there the discussion yesterday we had um so um i don't know it's it's a future that wait, i just want to say one thing is is that you know we as architects we think we're very futuristic you know we always because everything we do potentially could be built in the future every design we make could potentially be built but we're actually very nostalgic in how we approach things so in many schools of architecture we will study many courses on history you know i'm sure that augustine teaches you guys history you know um but we need to be looking forward we need to be looking forward not backwards you know i think that's the the real challenge how do you and we there are no very few schools i think liam young um <clears throat> is one of the few people at SIARC who really speculates about the future we need to speculate about the future we need to think about the future because in a way the future is connected to the to the past anyway there's a famous comment that wolf pricks mentions and he often gives a lecture on this title in two days time tomorrow will be yesterday or we could even say tomorrow today will be yesterday we're all kind of connected and we need to really think about this and in architecture we're not just not doing that you know i, I there are best-selling books out there that are already telling us what's going to happen um and architects are kind of like ostriches they've got their head in the sand the only book I've seen about the future of architecture was was it was something like the future of architecture and a hundred designs, where some architect said, "This is going to be influential. This design is going to be influential. This building here is going to." So what? It's the whole system we need to sort of think about. And anyway, you know, I think for for us as architects, the question is not how we design our future, how to design buildings, but how do we design our future? Uh, and and. This especially for those of us who are involved in education, because it's precisely the generation of, of students we're teaching now who will be out there and facing these challenges. We have to be prepared for that. We have to recognize it's on the horizon and adjust to it. Now, I was a student in Cambridge where um, <clears throat> when computers came out in the 1980s, we weren't allowed to use computers in the architectural design studio. Um, there were certain professors and they were all reading Heidegger. And that's why <clears throat> I don't think my book, Forget Heidegger, is controversial. I think Heidegger's controversial. You know, we've got to really update our thinking beyond that old fashioned um, uh, way of thinking. But we, we would, so the smart students, we weren't allowed to use them. The smart ones would use computers and they would do hand tracings over the top of their computer drawings and pretend they did that, right? I mean, pretend it was a hand drawing, but it wasn't. And the not so smart ones would not use computers and they would be unemployable. They would go into the marketplace and nobody would employ them because by then you had to be able to have some computational expertise. So like it or not, we are going to get to that situation with AI. At the moment, there are a lot of P voices that were several voices out there that I don't think are really very realistic. And they, they seem to re replicate that same syndrome. Um, and I won't go into that discussion now, but you know, I think we've got to recognize that it's here and it's going to be increasing and we have to, we have to learn to survive. That's the only way we're going to be able to do it. Um, and you guys, you're so good at computation. I, I, I don't know. I think that uh, um, Romanians could play a, a major role in it, provided you find out about these things really soon. Um, it needs to be taught. And I, my prediction is it's going to be taught by the end of this decade 
in every single school of architecture. We're not even taught. It'll be there. It'll just happen, just as it's on our phones now. It'll it'll be part of our lives. So the sooner we recognize that, the better, because otherwise we'll be like dinosaurs. We will just die off, you know. And if we can harness the potential of AI and work with it, then we can explore new possibilities. And I, I would just say that you know the architectural imagination, I think, is something very special. You know, um, I, we we. We traditionally think because we, we're, taught, we're taught certain skills. How do you design? How do you think three dimensionally? And how do you understand material behaviors? These skills are, are very transferable and very marketable. Now, our problem with architects, with architecture is we think they related to, to, to buildings, to putting bricks on top of bricks. But actually, you can deploy that imagination in many different arenas. Um, here in LA, there are there the I forget the name of the the, the, the director of the Tron Tron Legacy, but he was an architect, studied at Columbia. And then there are people like Greg Lynn who are designing shopping carts that follow you around, the AI. And there are people who, who work in the movie industry. There are people who work in, um, in the space industry. There are people who work uh, 3D printing food, you know? And I think that we have to think about the term architecture less in terms of the, the old fashioned notion of build, designing buildings, but more how you can use that incredible, extraordinary imagination that, human, that, that architects have and deploy it to imagine a better future world, a better future. And I would say that, you know, something like digital futures, I don't know if you've been watching it at all, but that was something that, that I designed in a sense. It was an architectural design in some sense. If you look at TED Talks, TED Talks were designed by, by an architect. And I think we have this capacity to really envision things and to understand systems in a way that uh, is remarkable uh, and to visualize them. That's a very strong visual imagination. So we have to think, how do we harness how do we harness our abilities to really um, to 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 be to, to get ahead, to be aware of what's happening, and, and and use those abilities in a way that is profitable? So it's kind of a wake up call. So you know, I'm I don't know whether 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 all the professors at Ian Minko now are, are telling their students that the the straight line is sacred or what, but um, I think that now's the time to really pay attention to that, and uh, also hopefully also include um, Naboka and. Uh, I just want to thank Dad Dana Weiss, by the way. Dana did a fantastic job in translating camouflage into Romanian. And I, I gave a talk in, in Cluj a while back. Um, so you've got real talent right there in, in Romania, computational talent, theoretical talent, um, and so on. Um, yeah. Um, sorry, may I ask a question? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Um, First of all, thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering now if I am like, as an architect student, um, and you mentioned that AI is um, um, doing many things like decision making, um, space analysis, and so on. Um, what would be the future for me? But what should I do to be part in the future? Um, I mean, now as an architect, um, we have been doing, like you mentioned, lots of historical work. And um, and there is quite a gap between um, the average architect and the technology. And the AI is kind of, um, in a way, it's it's a little bit advanced or not a basic technology piece. Um, so do you think um, architects should um, start learning AI in schools or technology in general? Oh, no question. No question. I mean, absolutely. Um, the, the, no question. I mean, in a way, I think it'll it'll happen anyway. It's, we are living in a world of AI already. We just don't realize it. Um, and we definitely have to have to sort of um, think about how we how we deploy this. I just want to say something because, you know, my background was a translator of Alberti and uh, it was when I was translating Alberti that I really began to sort of see what was happening. Um, uh, so I was working on history, right? And, and don't think that Alberti was a kind of conservative. He was a revolutionary, absolute revolutionary. You know, he was the one who invented the the Italian language or helped make it a move it from being a, a kitchen language into being an established language. But I was working on Alberti, and I remember the time with Joseph Rickford, and Joseph was saying, "Listen." This is, read this book. This is the style in which we should be writing. And this, of course, was the end of postmodernism, right, in the 1980s. And um, and actually what happened was something very different. You know, I was working and, and I didn't have my own 
lab we didn't have laptops in those days i was working in the in the, in the computer science department at the university of cambridge you no know? surrounded by computational geeks who had no social skills but they were absolute geniuses and i was sitting above uh, the the babbage lecture theater and babbage charles babbage was the first computer expert and we were sitting there in the computer science department and not only was i astonished by what these guys with these computer scientists were doing it was just mind-blowing i was seeing all this but the early days we were seeing the computer drawings coming out and things and it was the early days of cad and so on but you know what i began to also realize was was it's about process you know in the end it's not about what the style was but the process and before that, when you were writing something, you know, you would you would type something out and then you would tip X it out and maybe you but you couldn't do it too many times because it was so expensive. But when with a computer, we I was every single sentence in Alberti was I I I polished about 25 times. And and instead there have been following a style in the kind of postmodernist thing, what happened out of that procedure about being able to polish and polish and polish and polish and polish, and polish a new language began to emerge. It is in the process that, 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 that this is happening. So, you know, I always thought that the process of computation, the way that it would, it would influence architecture is in the process itself. So, you know, I think we have to sort of change that mindset. Um, um, and I mean, history, history tells us not that we should follow the past, but rather that the history, the history of, of architecture has been a history of kind of revolutions in some sense, of, of, of evolutions, of, of developments over time. And it's not about trying to conform to something in the past because Alberti was never conforming. You know, everyone was a revolutionary in some sort of way. So and we've got to, got to really rephrase our way of thinking to move from revolutionary styles to revolutionary new ways of thinking, to how to rethink what architecture itself could be, what the office could be, how would we operate? You know? And I produced a book called Rethinking Architecture, um, which is about how you use philosophers, Derrida and Deleuze, to kind of rethink architectural questions, we've got to rethink architecture in the age of AI, because this is going to be absolutely major. And we either get on board with it or we become obsolete, uh, like horses when they invented the car. So, um, you know, I think it's a challenge. It's a design challenge. And that's really what we should be doing. We should be designing our own futures um, and thinking about it and using this incredible imagination a nation that, that others don't have. But what I thought was astonishing is when I produced the book Digital Futures in AD back in 2009, and there was Patrick Schumacher saying, oh, it's going to be about parametricism and it's all that's going to be the future. But it wasn't right. And that we don't we see a bit of it, but no, there's no city built in a parametric way. What Ben Bratton did, um, Ben Bratton, who's very, very smart. And he's also in the series that we had on architecture and neuroscience, AI neuroscience and architecture. What Ben, ben Bratton said, no, no, uh, the city of the future forget all these new styles of architecture just look at what's happening with the iphone you know so in 2009 it was before uber was even even invented right he was saying we have to think about the way in which ai enables us to to re-navigate and reimagine the city because of because of what it does and that's exactly what we've got to do is not focus on styles but focus on how these new technologies can help us to reimagine and and so he was talking about how the information of coming out of the world of computation um, is so important um, and we should be informational architects not formal architects now a typical architectural response to that would be someone like um, mario carpo who says oh we live in an age of big data and big data is messy therefore we have to have a style of architecture that's messy forget it it's not about style i wouldn't say if you think about an uber car you know it's not as uber cars look any different to modern cars they just operate in very different sort of ways, you know, um, and, and they are ordinary cars. They're ordinary cars. Well, they're, they're nothing special about that. So we need to think about things in terms of different modes of operation, not different styles of architecture, different modes of operation and how the process of design itself um, um, and the process of, 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 of generating cities and so on um, is going to change. And maybe I, just one thing, final thing I say, we have to develop also a new language. Um, so, you know, what we're getting, if you look at some of these terms that have been used in the world of AI, it's about, you know, generation. You don't use the word, you talk about outcomes, not designs, outcomes and generation and so on. We need to, to change our mindset, change the kind of the, the way we, we think about things and the, the, the terms that we use, because um, it's there, you know, and, you know, the sooner we find out about the better, you, you're very lucky having Claudio there, because Claudio is one of the people 
who was so advanced um, uh, many well, many years ago. I, I I recall the story. Like maybe I got this wrong. That when you when you presented your uh, your thesis project, there was nobody there who could understand what you're talking about, and they had to go and delay the 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 the, the, the jury. Maybe I got that wrong. But you know, I think it's important to to read. Was that true? I get it. Yes, to some extent, it was correct. <laughs> no, but the problem is that you need to have this kind of let's say basis of of discussion, right? If, if, if this is the problem, right? Now we were formulating, let's say, okay, computation is in the past. Uh, of, of course, AI embeds everything, embeds computation, embeds everything. Even the, the, the parametrics, generative technologies are going to be the future. The only difference is that they're not going to be powered by a designer, but they're going to be powered by AI, right? And be creative. We also have to touch maybe a little bit on the this kind of, let's say, you mentioned it in the, one of the projects that the, the GPT like uh, tools will enable architects to design. Not by using a, the, the the traditional hand and the pencil, but actually by explaining what they want by by saying by verbally, uh, say, uh, enunciating their their ideas, right? Which is something very new. The only difference, interesting now, is that how would that be different from someone like the customer, like the client, enunciating the same ideas, right? Because normally, how are we different? What say? So no, so because now you have a customer, a client coming to you, let's say, to, to build a house, right? And you ask them questions about what they're interested in, whatever, what they like, what they don't like. And in the end, you as an architect propose a solution, right? But now the, the same customer, the same client can go directly to a GPT, like a, a, a three enabled system. And the system will understand to some extent, maybe GPT seven or whatever in the future of, of these systems will understand the need of the, of course, being uh, given access to the profile of the, of the customer, of all of the things that he does, you'll be able to understand better the person than an architect could, right? In multiple layers, psychologically, uh, uh, aesthetically, like the, the, what taste that this person have, what does he like, and so forth, and come with a solution, and not one, but several solutions, right? So our role will change because it will be what I was discussing, and this is my, my, my concept, we'll discuss, of course, together because it's part of the, the PhD, is that the metaverse will play a much more important role for architecture for, for two reasons. One, that we are going to definitely move there for a like a, a substantial amount of our time, the same time that we spend now in, in front of homes, we may end up spending much more in the virtual worlds because it's better, because it's a lot safer, whatever we want to to, uh, to find as a reason, because it's a, a better reality. That's a danger. We can discuss that another time. But also because at some time it will be very interesting for architects, especially for designers, a very prolific experimentation space. Right? You can you can try ideas, you can try concepts, you can you can play with AI. Without the, the the normal limitations of, of, of let's say uh, gravity and all of the tectonic side, right? So it will be a non-tectonic experience that still strives for tectonicity, in a sense, but it will be different. It will not be the gravity uh, as a force, but it will be the, the connection of humans because you still want to be uh, attached to to people and even to, to space, right? I don't, I don't think the flow flow floating in mid air will, will be anyone dream of, of paradise or, or no. You still want spaces. The only the only problem is that those spaces will be dynamic. Why not? Right? They can change in an instance if they need to, right? Because they don't have any limitations. All of the, the now everybody's like crazy with robots. Everybody's crazy with, uh, with let's say, of this kind of programming. Even the programming matter part. Yes, it, it will probably solve some problems on, on the physical world. But I think that the, the the challenging part will be actually to go beyond that because we'll have to design. I, I for for example, want to become one, one of the few relevant architects of the metaverse. I, I kind of completely <laughs> renounced. The need to be, uh, let's say, uh, uh, to have a contribution in the tectonic world, because there'll be a new breed of designers who have to, that will have to create those kind of virtual spaces, and the, those spaces hopefully will be created in a tasteful, let's say, designed way. But the role of the designer, and I think uh, Andrea mentioned that, will be embedded in a, in a substrate of, of design between what what I would call participatory design, where the users will be involved directly with designing the space, and the, all of the procedural and and all of the the system that, that, that will be powering the system. AI will be there and we actually make the link between what the user will want, what the architects will, will actually express. And we, we may end up being some kind of, let's say, uh, <laughs> the things that we train smart AI, AIs uh, for, for the future, at least within a, a time span. And then after that, we'll be, we'll be completely, let's say, merged <laughs> into some kind of, let's say, super intelligent uh, network that will be able to design to, to a higher level. And it will be seen like like the, 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 the I don't know the cavemen's that painted in Lascaux, <laughs> right? That, that started some 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 other revolution. I do agree with you that the AI revolution will be potentially much more impactful than everything else preceding it. And but it will not be the last one. I think the AI will, will evolve 
into something much more interesting in some way. We're still, I think, limited in the way we see the, the true potential. I'm not talking about people here, but still we're conservative, like you said, in, in the view of, the, of AI. And I think that the future will actually still give us not the AI, uh, sorry, winter, but some really interesting surprises in the, in the sense of what it will be, uh, I know, having in store for us for, for the near future. I'm not even talking about 50 years, I'm talking about 10 to 15 years. And that's why for the students now, being ignorant or <laughs> ignoring this aspect will be basically signing your, your own architectural debt world in that sense. And I also have a problem with the idea of, of what the architect will be in 10 years time, what it should be like, right? What am I, what is Daniel? What are we doing? What you're, you, Neil, what, what are you actually? Are you an architect, a theoretician? Are you an, uh, a physiologist? Are you a neuroscientist to some extent? So we, we don't even know that because you, we are forced to dive in so many fields to understand so many new stuff that I think at, at the end of, let's say, a decade or two decades, most of most, what we are now as architects will be either completely redefined or it will vanish completely as a, as a, as a job and we have to become data scientists, I don't know, but emotional or neuro, whatever, right? So it, it's a danger. The data of architecture that you, you're uh, calling for, it's true. It will happen. Now we can morph or we can vanish. I think we only have two, two options, adopt or be excluded, basically. I'm not, I'm not sure if you agree on this one, because I haven't read your second no, book. No, <laughs> I I, no, absolutely, I do. But I, what, all I would say is I'm, I'm a little more skeptical about the metaverse. But what I would say, and this is something I didn't touch on today, because you get into a whole new yeah. realm of, of, um, of questions. But, you know, I think that what is happening in neuroscience and it, it's it, it, from a theoretical perspective we are going through the most exciting moment ever in my entire career i have never come across the ideas that are appearing right now in other words it's not just that ai and neuroscientists are coming together and, and they're talking about what is intelligence that's not the, it's also we're getting arts and science coming together and we're getting industry and, and academia coming together and there's something absolutely amazing. Now, what I would simply say, and I don't want to go down that rabbit hole at the moment, but you know, we're talking about uh, the, 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 the theoretical thing is telling us we are already living in a simulation, already living in a simulation, because our brain is locked into this brainy skull. We don't actually see what's getting on there. We get signals coming on. We're trying to interpret what the hell's out there. Now, I won't go into that, but uh, Anil Seth's book, Being You, opens up this kind of question. He's also got a TED talk about this. Um, where he says that we are hallucinating our realities. And, and I think these people are already suggesting that they're all saying the same thing. We're modeling the world in our brain. You know, we, we have a model of the world inside our brain, literally. You know, when you wander around, if, 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 if Claudio dyes his beard orange tomorrow, I will notice it because I know what his beard was like today. You know, so we already have a model of the world inside ourselves. We're living in a kind of simulation as well. So from a theoretical perspective as well, this is absolutely a revolutionary time. It's ne I've never seen this before, and I've never been so energized by, by what's happening. It's not just design, it's theoretical questions that are really happening, and they're calling into question everything that we believed in. And we either sink or swim. We either you know, get on board or we become dinosaurs, frankly. And the danger is, like you said, that we'll be okay and not even care about it. Like exactly like you said, we won't even notice it because we'll be so comfortable in our own, uh, let's say, ignorance to some extent, right? That we actually don't even realize that we are getting there and, or, until it's too late, like, like the frog model. <laughs> let me, let me just, uh, just ask you, can you even imagine what it was like in an age before uh, Wi-Fi, before laptops, before mobile phones? an age of faxes, right? You know, there was an age and it wasn't so long ago. And we can't even imagine, I can't even imagine, imagine what life was like before COVID. So we will just, we'll just move on and forget about the past and forget about everything. It's just the way that the society operates. So it is boiling a frog. The boiling the frog metaphor is something that, that Daniel and I talk about a lot, but it is so important to think about. It's so important. No, but the question is, do we actually allow ourselves to jump at what point? You know that the paradox is that the, the frog becomes so so tired to the small adjustments that it doesn't have the energy to, to jump when it should, right? So it falls. So I, I, this is our, our question: When do we jump? <laughs> do we still adapt, like just slightly, like like the frog does, to for, for the small uh, deltas in temperature, or do we jump now and find ourselves in, in in I mean missing a little bit of it? That's interesting. I think that the frog should be there until it's kind of comfortable, and then jump at the right moment. Uh, not wait enough, but also not, not jump from day one, right? Because otherwise, it's losing the the, the, uh, how do we say, the evolution uh, 
uh, phenomenon, right? So it's it's kind of uh, interesting. Yeah. I think we should jump before it's too late, but not before that. Well, <laughs> so, it's, it's, so the metaphor is not sink or swim, sink or swim. It's jump, or get boiled alive. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, but when but when do you jump? It's important. That's the point to me, right? Because you, uh, those adaptations are useful in, in themselves, right? So this is also evolutionary, right? If you adapt enough, of course, at some point your adaptation will cost you energy, and it will be become impossible you don't have the energy left to jump but before that when you still have the energy it's interesting to jump at the very last minute because you have the better view of the boiling pot and what's going on outside but that's again a metaphor within a metaphor but it's fun to think of that because we have to do that otherwise we'll not, we'll not understand what what we're jumping out of that's also interesting because the pot is is the complexity of the world and all of the things that evolve are there right we, we need to adapt and that demands more and more energy more of our time more of our focus right and at some point we can say, okay, burnout, that's the, the, the normal solution. Unfortunately, we have friends in the, the job that kind of, uh, it's easy to, to burn out today, right? I think this is a problem of students of architecture everywhere in the world. It, it was from, from, from the, the very beginning because it's a very demanding uh, job and even school to, to, to go through. But now I think the whole pressure of having to, to know this and that and that basically everything, right? It, it's, it's, to most people, it, it seems to be unbearable, right? So that's what I'm saying that I think architectural school are, are slowly boiling frogs at this moment. And, we, and the students, as frogs, we have to, 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 I mean, they have to decide when to jump out and to avoid jumping into another boiling pot, which is a little bit more <laughs> right advanced. So it, it's, it's interesting that this metaphor that we have to be aware of the, the shifting environment, also on the pressure we, without giving up, but also trying to adapt and to adjust ourselves to the point of being able to become something maybe different than a frog, a super frog, like a super adaptive frog or whatever. The mega frog or the meta frog, sorry, it's even better like that, right? Yeah, I mean, just I think there's a comment that Ray Kurzweil makes about the human brain, and, and the reason why you have a brain is order to in order to predict. And of course, AI does a lot of prediction. You look at the data and you predict things. But the, the reason why Ray Kurzweil gives, he says, you know, the, the, we develop the brain because you know, if you were a simple kind of cave person wandering along and you saw a dinosaur or something or some wild animal. You would predict if you kept walking that same direction you'd meet it so you would change your direction well instead of a dinosaur or a wild animal we've got ai so we need to predict and need to go and change change the direction in which we are going absolutely no question um yeah well, i would like to uh challenge a bit the way in which the discussion unraveled because i think uh, it was uh, quite uh, architect centric and it, uh, it, we discuss somehow like uh, we are these guys that uh, uh, there will be a tool that will appear and then the, we will be tossed aside and the rest of the world will be uh, better off without us. Uh, this is the kind of mistake that Black Mirror makes. They uh, choose a, a part of uh, society or a part of the world. They make it super sci-fi and then the rest is the same and just reacts to it. And I don't think it uh, really works like that. Um, if there will be a death of the architect. I think it will be provoked by artificial general intelligence. And if, if there is artificial general intelligence, I think we are dealing with the death of every possible profession in the world. And uh, our purpose as human will be so different by then that I don't think we can be classified as just uh, uh, jobless losers. Uh, it, it will be a, it will be a, a shift of paradigm paradigm so i just don't think that we um uh the death of the architect will i i just think that if we die quote as architects uh we are the last to go uh, everyone goes down with us and uh we are we're not just those guys that will be tossed aside while everyone just minds uh, their own business it will be a general uh a shift of paradigm so yeah uh, probably not even uh, what you mentioned earlier that uh, some some guy will uh, go uh, to an ai to design his house uh, will that uh, even happen anymore i mean if we are to that stage uh, how will the, the ownership uh, system work how will the economic system work will i will even uh, the idea of asking to do a house, to make a house for myself even exists. We will live in some kind of uh, uh, huge hive and not have um, uh, much agency in uh, making our own house, something like that. It's, it's just, I just uh, think it is wise to not uh, 
make that black mirror mistake and uh, uh, be aware that if architecture is replaced being so complex to make uh, it means uh, it probably means that every other profession goes away uh, including uh, what you mentioned earlier like a data scientist or whatever uh, ai if ai does architecture i think it will do that as well no you you're, you're right you know I, I didn't want to mention all that because i mean this is it can, the discussion can go on but i one thing i do do is with my students like i ask them to do a black mirror episode as part of their submission for my theory course you know they they do two things one's a black side and one's a, the positive side and the they love the Black Mirror episode, I can tell you that. No, but I mean, I think you're, you're right. There is no space outside. And if you jump on, you know, let's say the ship is sinking, you get into, an, into a, a lifeboat, but the lifeboat itself is also sinking. So you know, there's no point going into sort of 3D printing or something and when that's also going to be suffering. But, but, but yes, we, we, we just, I think the point is we, we, we literally were like, we're like ostriches because we just have got our hands, our heads in the sand and are not addressing those things. There are so many books out there that are looking at this and every profession, you're absolutely right. Every profession is going to be affected um, and they already are, you know, they already are. You know, we, I was astonished because it doesn't happen in the States so much, went home to England and you go to a supermarket and what's happened to the people, the, the, the cashiers, the, the till that are kind of like a, you're giving your money to and they're, you know, the, the, you do it yourself. It's so that whole generation just has disappeared. So I think that it is happening absolutely everywhere. and. Uh, uh, we've got to be aware of that. Um, I, so I don't know what the answer is, but maybe the, the, the way that I think there was a comment made once um, in kind of world of philosophy to say, well, we don't know what the answer is, but at least if you're aware of a problem, it becomes a different kind of problem. It's not a problem by which you are trapped because you don't know it's a problem. Rather, it's one that you recognized and you can uh, begin to deal with. So what the answer is, I don't know, but the first important thing is to recognize the problem. Absolutely. But you're right, Mary. It's absolutely, it's everywhere. Um, it's it's going to happen everywhere. You know, I, it, yeah. So let's use our architectural imaginations to be, to imagine this scenario, you know, and think it through and, 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 and try and work out what it is that we can, can, can do and operate, you know, uh, it's anyway, you know, I, whether it's going working in the metaverse or whatever, I mean, yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure what the answer is. That's all I can say. So, but neither you, just, sorry, so just well, one aspect, because I think it's relevant. You said that Black Mirror does one thing wrong in the sense that it only, uh, let's say, uh, goes on the science or the fiction side on one element. I think Neil can also watch uh, for this. Two or three episodes of Black Mirror are already happening in China, right? In China, the, the social rating uh, system actually prevents people for, for uh, taking, I don't know, uh, first class or actually taking any flights or taking high speed trains and stuff like that, right? So people are not allowed based on their social score to 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 perform specific, they, they're not allowed to go for, I don't know, more than three star hotels and so forth, right? So the model that you see in the, in the, in the Black Mirror that was making fun of that rating system, right? And, and it, again, it pushed that to the extreme, to some extent already exists and it's actually affecting people's life at a global level, well, millions of people, right? Um, billions of people in China are affected by that system. It's not yet fully implemented, but it works in a lot of cities, right? So that's already there. It's not only Black Mirror, it's not, it's not the future, it's the, the now. Another system, one of the episodes of Black Mirror shows this idea of being uh, imprisoned in, in full open, right? <laughs> so being, uh, and this also happens in China. You have people that, uh, I've seen that in, in, the, in the subway, right? Uh, there was a, one, one guy walking past me and all of the ads turned into some kind of red uh, billboards with, with his face on and some text that I didn't understand. I asked, what is that? And they told me this guy, the, the, the banner said, the Barish citizens, this guy is not paying his taxes or whatever, right? So it's kind of <laughs> being already uh, ostracized. And, and, and I understand that because of that, he's losing his wife, his friends, because all of the, the friends, if they interact with the guy, are losing their social points or the social credit, right? So everything is kind of connected. And what you're saying now behind that, everything is going to come uh, like a car, house of cards. It's not really true because already we have in, in the normal society, in a Chinese society, I wouldn't call it normal, but it's not yet the futuristic, uh, I don't know, um, it's not that futuristic, right? It has more AI, it has more surveillance, true, but already those models in Black Mirror, so that, that I think Black, Black Mirror is actually a very uh, accurate <laughs> analysis of, the, and I think it's a good idea for Cornel to have his students uh, write a Black Mirror episode, because this is actually not necessarily going to happen as a one, uh, let's say, global catastrophe, or let's say, uh, employment uh, catastrophe. No, it's going to, to, to affect things 
slowly, exactly like, like Neil said, that's what we were discussing about the, the front model. I think more about the front model, slightly, people, jobs are going out, there's no more movement, there's no more newspaper guys, there's no more fax machine, we will we'll probably lose the phones, we don't need the phones anymore, we don't need uh, video TVs, everything will be in our heads, in our brains, and at, at some point, we just realized, fuck, <laughs> we're now in the Black Mirror episode number, whatever, where we, we can now simulate the whole reality, we can do whatever we want, and we, like, like Neil said, we won't know if this is another simulation inside of simulation inside of simulation, right? Or, or are we trapped in our own um, simulation of the mind that simulates the, the universe, right? So I agree with you that it may, it definitely will come with a, a, a raw implication. However, I don't think it necessarily has to go down in, in the same boulder like everything else. I think we, we may end up with, with, with things that Black Mirror uh, and the, those kind of localized, uh, let's say, futuristic uh, explorations will be able to, to give us a very good feedback we should look uh, at Black Mirror. I'm taking it and it was one of the most interesting insights into what technology can potentially do. And they also have positive episodes, not only negative, but most of them are negative in, in one sense at least, right? So I think this is the, the danger. Like Neil said, the knife is very sharp and very tempting, right? You can cut or you can kill. I don't know if you kill the architect or you just make it, we give him a very super uh, efficient tool to cut the future or to carve the future. Let's call it beautifully. Right? Yeah. Sorry. Because it's, no, that you should record that, and that really is recorded. You can maybe that's a little TED talk in itself. No, but I think you're absolutely right, Claudia. I mean, so I mean, um, let's just think about this a moment. I mean, um, China is a good example, and I often talk about Blade Runner in terms of China because you know we don't have flying cars, we've got maglev trains, and if you think about the visions of in Blade Runner, actually Shanghai has got the kind of the the advertisements on buildings in a way that no one else has, but they also pay for things um, by facial recognition, you know, and uh, so, you know, we think about, just think the logic of this. So now, I, we've just been through a major kind of, um, uh, I don't know what you call it, but COVID forced us, to, they kind of, it kind of forced us to recognize that we are already in a digital future. Now, we've been talking about this in digital futures, how we, about the future, but then suddenly we had all these possibilities of, of contactless payment, of, of, of ordering food online, of, of, um, of having Zoom. We never used it, but we were forced to use it. Now, and I think now, if you just think about that, you know, what what are, what will the future be? Just think through it logically. You know, if you've got facial recognition, what do you need? You know, you so I, my, one of the predictions I make in the book, and it doesn't take much to predict it, right? But we don't have we won't have cash. We're already cash has gone out, right? Because of because of the dangers of COVID in many places, you don't you can't use cash. We won't have keys because we can use other facial recognitions to get into things. We won't have passports. Why the hell do we need a passport? You know, it's all the data. That's just symbolic. Already the data's online you know and and so we won't have we won't have pens because we'll talk to things we we you know what we have in our pockets right now i don't think there's anything about our paper handkerchief that we'll need in the future and, and just we've just got to you know, just be realistic about it it's it's not as though it needs to be a kind of fiction it's just the way things are going and you know and if we as architects are meant to be imagining the future then we've got to harness and understand the forces that are going to be changing the future and make them work towards our advantage rather than being trapped by them. I think one of the biggest problems 20 or so years ago when the digital revolution happened is everybody thought there would be this kind of like emancipated future where we could be progressive and whatever. All we got was spam. All we got was spam. And, and I think, you know, the point that Douglas Rushkoff made at my first ever conference 2002, I think at the RBA years ago, he said, we have got to understand these processes and make them work for the benefit of humanity. And I think that's absolutely the case. And uh, it might just be that the term architect, which is already in any case, you Google the word architect, you get software, right? Software architect. But maybe that's the transition that we think about. That in other words, we, 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 we think about it uh, and we use that architectural imagination, which is something very special, but operating in a different medium and a different way of thinking. So maybe we'll all become you know, architects of the, of the, of the metaverse. But I would just like to say one thing uh, about that, Claudio. I'm not so convinced about that. Back in 1999, this is a long time ago, I had a student who was predicting the future of shopping. And actually, uh, he did an online shopping exercise. It was when Amazon was struggling. Amazon was really struggling that time. And his vision was completely wrong. He thought it would be a three-dimensional experience and you'd, you'd, kind of, you'd go through this kind of space and uh, um, a, a three-dimensional space and go shopping. Uh, and Actually, he ended up getting a very good job in, in, in kind of media, whatever it was, the media art world, um, being paid way more than an architect would get paid. But, but what we've noticed in terms of shopping is that's not quite what happened. If you we, we go online 
and there are other possibilities, but we basically we're just scrolling through things, right? And oh, we're getting human, we're getting, we're getting customer recommendations, almost the most important thing. That's part of that logic. If you go through a supermarket now, you're looking at a thing and saying, well, how good is that particular product? You've got, almost got to go online and go and scan it and get some feedback to get that. So I think maybe the metaverse is not going to be the same as our other verses. I, I, I actually beg to differ here. I would say that your expectation at that point of what the student managed to, to show was actually correct, not so correct for the, the, that time, but it actually proved to be correct 20 years later, because that's the future, I think. This kind of personalized. This is important because what I think the, the most important thing that the, the, the metaverse will bring is this kind of customized experience of the space, right? Uh, whether it's a virtual space or within the, the the physical space, augmented reality, right? Because now it will be all about you. Like I said, I think that the world with, you go into a shop, and if you're rich, they're not going to show you that the cheap TVs or the cheap no. They're going to promote the high end things that you can afford and make in the sense you want, right? So that's it's already. A form of augmentation of the reality and of the experience. And if you go into a virtual, I'm actually building this kind of, so I'm giving a little bit out of the house. I'm, I'm working on exactly this kind of uh, virtual spaces that you'll have this personalized experience when you shop, when you experience them. Like, for example, when Samsung is launching a new product, you will need the space and you'll need the experience that is going to match you, on, on one end your, your, your financial level, but also even if you're not very uh, uh, rich or if you're, it doesn't matter even. Because in the end, you want to have this customized experience. You want to be to feel uh, important. You want to feel uh, like I don't know, let's say precious, like this kind of uh, thing. You've seen the phenomena of NFTs, right? NFTs are now blooming because they give this kind of, in a sense, false sensation of ownership and of, of being different and and un unique, right? This is a need that people already have for from for ages. That's why you buy, uh, unless you're you're an art uh, expert, you buy a Picasso because you know it's worth a lot. In the sense of and having the only one or the original makes you entitles you to, to ownership, right? I think this is something interesting. People will want to entitle spaces. I'm working now on, on what I called experiential NFTs or spaces that are going to be experiences, not, not, not spaces, but are special experiences that are going to be unique. So you can actually experience something. And then if you decide to own that experience and be the only one that has that spatial whatever. We'll discuss a little bit because we haven't had time to catch up uh, since I was sick. But it will. This is, I think, part of the future that you see a little bit. Let's say um, I, I do bet more on the virtual than on the real. And I know it's weird in, in a sense, but in terms of revolution, I think the virtual will enable more revolution than the physical. Physical is slow, costs money, is sluggish. It's, it's. I would say it's kind of again the bureaucracy uh, uh, driven or or in, in the way not driven but stopped, right? Where the virtual things at this point, yes, it's crazy. Yes, it's very new territory. Nobody knows what the metaverse or how many metaverses will there be. However, there will be things that will, will have relevance. And I think designers should already, again, this is my interest, and we'll discuss more, of course, but this is my interest. How do we, what, what are we turned into, like transformed by the, the virtual as architects, as designers? We're not going to be the, let's say, the, uh, how to say, um, the creatures we were before. We don't have the same status anymore. We won't have the same prestige even, right? Because it will be different. We now architects are famous because they have this kind of experience and they know stuff. They, they study for a lot of years, very hard years. So that's why people kind of respect us, which is relevant. Uh, sorry, and uh, relative <laughs> because not, not everybody respects architects, right? But we we are easy to replace. From most, even an engineer can say, if you don't do it like I say, the house is going to fall in your head. If you say, if you don't do it like I said, it will be ugly. And they'll say, but I like it, <laughs> like that, right? So this is all relevant and relative, right? In in the VR space, in the virtual space, things are going to, to, to I think it's like a primordial soup in the sense, right? Things are going to happen much faster. Reactions, chemical reactions will be will be catalyzed and, and happen much faster. And I think it will be a very prolific space for exploration. This is my bet, I, I may be wrong. But what I want to say is that your student that, that imagined this kind of three-dimensional uh, space or experience maybe might have been too ahead of his time, <laughs> but actually be right on the longer term, right? Not then. Amazon then, or the, the successful recipe for Amazon was not his vision, but his vision maybe actually proved uh, valid 30 years later. I don't know. So yeah, something like that. We're already 20 years later or 30 years later. So I would say that his, his results were relevant, <laughs> just, not, just not yet. The technology was not there. The bandwidth was not there. The, the, the procedural systems were not there. However, what he analyzed as being relevant, I think was, it was correct. And it will be even different, of course, but I think you, your student was on the right path, just uh, too early on it <laughs> for, for the technology to catch up. 
you know, I think, I think also I mean, Minority Report was also predicting that, right? And, I, you know, it is interesting, the world of the cinema is much more um, provocative in its kind of, its, its speculations about the future than we as architects are. I mean, we're really behind on these kind of things. So absolutely. No, I, I, I think what, all I would say is that, I, you know, how do we just, how do we take this architectural imagination and, and, and take it into a different sphere? And I, I, so for me, digital futures was one example of this, right? How do you suddenly create a world platform where, I mean, just take, for example, PhD research, right? Because you know, on Sunday, I get my PhD students from Tongji and whatever else, we all come together on a single platform. That is revolutionizing education. You know, in the old days, you had one professor in one's classroom talking to a single group of students, and with PhD students in particular, it's absurd because you're working all on your own. Why can't you all come together? And why can't you all come together whereby you don't just have your professor telling you again and again and again, you get the best person. You get Akimengas coming and teaching you about robotics. You know, you get Daniel Bolojan giving you a lesson on whatever it is, you know, or something. And you have this space in which you, you're happening. And we've got to radically rethink education. You know, this is something I've got two copies this week. I've got to, after this, I've got to prepare my paper for the next one. When we look at the future of education, do we need classrooms, even? You know, do we need classrooms? And it, I mean, it's they're so expensive. You've got to, you know, maintain them. You've got to, you've got to, you know, uh, pay for security. You've got to repaint them, and God knows what else. You know, um, why can't we just think about how we operate in a different sort of way? And, and 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 you know, we should be radical as architects, but we're not. We we are very conventional thinkers, and we've really got to shift our mindset to really think about how we can imagine a better future world. And it, it's kind of clear the writing's on the wall, right? We've suddenly, COVID helped us. COVID and AI are the big game changers in our world today. We've got to somehow engage with that. Um, if I may add something, uh, four years ago, I guess, in a, a, to Bucharest come the president of Grenoble Institute of, Architect of Artificial Intelligence. And he had a lecture at a French, uh, a French embassy about AI. And I was there in the audience and someone asked him, why do you come here to talk us about AI? And he said that uh, if we want to be actors, we will be, become consumers. So I really encourage you to become, to be actors. Uh, so, and, uh, so that's my thought for today. Uh, as architects, if we want to be actors in this, uh, in this game, we will just be, become consumers. So this will be, <laughs> uh, this is, we should engage with this to, to become actors and to, 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 to drive it in that direction that we want. And as you know, uh, Mordred Stinson uh, publication, Arch Arch Architectural Intelligence, and those uh, uh, actors that were in the beginning, Nicolas Negroponte, and, uh, and they were those first architects that they, they set the way. So uh, we should, should engage and become the actors. <laughs> Well, I just would simply say that I think that book is a bit old fashioned because actually the Yes, was, no, uh, yes. I think Nicholas Necroponte was part of the problem, you know, because he was kind of pursuing symbolism. And, and, and actually, when I was doing my research, it was kind of remarkable because nothing that had been done at MIT was actually really relevant. It's all happened at two, after 2006 and, and, you know, things have completely changed. But let me just say one thing, because I, I actually, I don't know if it was the last lecture I gave at the Ominka was about, was the one where Daniel Bologen was there, but one of the last ones I was giving, and I was, I was talking about China, and, and I was just kind of recounting certain things that I'd observed in China, and somebody else said, why is that relevant to us today? Well, Claudio just told you, right? He, he was talking about China right now, and whether we like it or not, you know, uh, and uh, things are happening there, which are, which, which are, are showing the way forward. So, you know, I think we just as architects, we've got to be, remain open minded and, and, and imagining a future with this technology. Now, how is that? What is it going to be? But, you know, it doesn't, you know, it hasn't got to be genius. The writing's on the wall and it's not about styles of architecture. It's about ways of operating and harnessing the capacity of AI. Mm -hmm. That seems to me very clear. It's not only AI, but that's going to be one of the, the key drivers. So you've got Claudio there telling you, telling you about the future. So pay attention, right? Um, um, it's not that the straight line is sacred, rather the future is going to be dominated by these new technologies and we have to, we have to adapt to survive. Um, that's the only way forward. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to um, circulate a little bit about, um, because 
like the discussion now is about how the future is gonna um, kind of demolish architects in a way if they don't keep up with what's happening. But um, if I could bring the argument of uh, the creative mind, um, if I could put the creative per perception into this formula and say, and say, for example, um, um, so, I mean, if, if we want to mention like the AI um, or what you have been talking about, it's, it's mostly logical and and the creative aspect of it is kind of a little bit not that emphasized um, in a sense that, let's say, I mean, if I would take the film industry, for example, since it's artistic field, um, for example, let's say, um, Star Trek when it started to be aired in 1960s and it started to bring some sort of weed gadgets um, uh, showing um, something that looks like our phones today. But um, all this was coming from maybe one or two single-minded uh, people that um, had some sort of a creative perception. And now we, now we are decades ahead and we find that this is actually a, a reality. And then we look, have a look, let's say, at, at the Road of the Rings or such uh, creative science fiction things that um, have world building, um, uh, very creative and deep lore within them that there is no way um, I imagine, again, I'm just thinking about from, um, let's say, quote unquote, creative ego. So do you think with all this that architects are going to since we are in our artistic field, do you think architects' uh, creativity will prevail? I mean, instead of taking AI as something that would quote unquote kill us, we could use it as a tool. <laughs> yeah, let me, okay, so first of all, world, you mentioned a lot of things in there. And, and I want to say that, that Alex McDowell, who's one of the, the proponents of world buildings based here in LA, and he's, his brother's an architect, by the way, and he was involved in Minority Report. And uh, you know, of course, so, so there are things happening. And in Minority Report, there were various sort of gadgets that were developed, speculated about that actually happened, like Oblong, who is kind of the gesture-based system and so on. So there are a lot of things happened, I think, in that time, looking, looking forward, um, that were done, uh, that done through that sort of realm. But let me be, this is actually, I don't want to be get, go sidetracked too much, but let me be really provocative here, really provocative. And this is part of another lecture. And I say, we think we're being creative. Are we? Now, because if you look at AlphaGo, I don't think that AlphaGo was created. It was a very effective system that found the best solution. And we said, oh, what a genius, it's a creative. Well, let's even take the point, well, maybe we're not so creative. Maybe we even take the view that, that the term creativity is something we just say, oh, it's a, a term we use to express what we can't understand. Now, I want to use make a comparison with magic. Now, I don't think there is any such thing as magic. Okay, and that, that's a provocation. But you know, if you if you see a magician, you know, the little kids think that the magician's pulling a rabbit out of a hat or whatever magicians do. That's not magic. That's not magic at all. The, there's a kind of game being played. They're concealing the operations, and we look at it and say, oh, magic or Oh, creative, but actually maybe it's a simple sort of process. We just don't understand it. And therefore we give it this kind of aura of creativity. I'm not so sure that creativity is actually quite what we think it is. And that's a, a really provocative sort of statement. But no, I think we need to be provocative. We need to really put the questions out there and, and, uh, and challenge ourselves. We're in a period right now where we have to. We've got to do that. But maybe that's a bit, uh, but yeah, but, but just think about, you know, that's my point is it, imagine what the future will be. Um, and it might not be a future in which we, we which the, the role of the creative architect has much to do, but maybe we can use our minds to imagine that right now. So that's why you know, Claudia is with you. So you're in good hands, right? So, uh, I mean, what can I say? What can I say? However, I, I may not agree with the fact uh, for, for to be creativity, it's a very smart way to look from a different perspective that nobody has uh, was able to see, right? And I do believe that in this particular case, being able to look at the new perspective, AI is, is f fantastically powerful, right? This is one of the strengths of, of AI is that it's able to connect multiple uh, elements, parameters, whatever you want, right? And look at a thing from a different perspective. This is exactly what happened in the game of uh, Go. It, it was no pure creativity in the sense that we, we someone, I don't agree with Neil that we have this kind of, we almost worship creativity as some kind of outer, I don't know, <laughs> esoterical power. It's not that. It's just a way 
smart people are able to look at things like even normal things from a different perspective, right? AI can do that on multiple levels, on multiple <laughs> complexities or like uh, orders of complexity, and even in a fraction of the, the 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 time that we can do it, right? So this idea that we humans are special and we have this creativity that no machine is going to 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 attain. It's, it's on, on the one hand, yes, it sounds nice. Sorry for, for disappointing the uh, unites that uh, it, it's going to happen. It's already happening, right? First of all, and this kind of, let's say, love for the sacred of, of the human uh, creativity is going to be completely like Neil showed or also or couldn't show in some cases, but it definitely illustrated is going to be revolutionized by the, the way that AI is approaching us a topic, right? Uh, I just want to give an example. There was a, a jet fight. A simulation where the best pilots of the U.S. Navy, uh, sorry, of the U.S. Air Force, were, were were summoned to fight against one AI, right? And that one AI bit that kicked the, the shit out of everyone, and then they gave the AI a, a very, uh, let's say, old-fashioned uh, airplane, limited in range, limited in sensors, and still they got kicked. And then, then they also so they crippled the, the thing to the almost like not 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 even being able to fly. And you know how how did he? Or the it, or I, I call it he, he already, right? How the AI managed to win by actually playing the the other the other pilots against each other. So that's that that's the the, the, the thing here. We, we risk of being played by the AI, and we risk of, the more we think that we're special and gifted and, and creative, the less <laughs> um, true that is going to prove to be. So we have to embrace the, our limits. To my perspective, we're limited. That's not to say that our creativity creativity is worthless. I think we should actually use creativity. And to, to actually train networks that are actually mining in a sense our minds right because some yes we do have some uh, at this point we, we haven't uh, created the high level uh, ai that we're, we're still afraid of there's no skynet or no other systems that are, are are being able to 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 handle that kind of complexity however we do have localized systems that can perform ex extremely well like the go now we know that we have alpha go and then we have alpha zero and then we have sorry the alpha go zero and then now we have the alpha zero which can learn to play any game the same system, the same model can play uh, Go, chess, well, whatever you want, right? So that that's the future. Now we think about architecture in a very limiting way. Say, ah, this is art. This is uh, whatever. No, it's it's more science than art. It has always been in a sense, right? And the sciencey part is going to take over, and it will prove that science can be cre more creative than than the the post art view of of uh, of being uh, you know this kind of inspired genius like the the, the human. No, AI will be more inspired and more genial. Although it will do it in a machinistic way, if you want, but you can also be also impressed, like like uh, Lisa Dole was, by the beauty of the result. The process itself was maybe trivial, machinistic, but the the end result was beautiful and and in that sense overly creative and and, and impressive. And if I recall correctly, he gave up playing a professional go because of that. In the end, right? Not yeah. not that, but a few years, like uh, last year, he gave up because he realized that he will never be able to 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 go to that level. And this is. I don't want that to happen to us. <laughs> it will be uh, the, the right thing, the, the elegant thing to do to kind of resign. But I think we can do better than that. But it's not going to be by, um, I don't know, uh, nurturing our egos into being, oh, I'm so special. No, it will not be that. It will, will have to be flexibility, adaptability, and, and putting our minds together to train models that will think at Zaha and Rem and <laughs> whatever. And in some cases, they will give a solution that will be very, very new and very, we still can invent. Right, AI will help us show uh, the, the, the solution space is so wide that we barely scratch the surface. And even the superstars, they all of them mostly found their own little space that they explored to the max. And yes, you can recognize uh, Koldas or whatever. Uh, well, actually, it's a different example there, but you can have, I don't know, you can definitely see Zaha, you can definitely see uh, Kupio Blau uh, as, uh, okay, uh, uh, as having found the space that they explore to the max, right? But AI will help us explore the social space to much, much, uh, let's say, deeper, uh, not only formally, that's the problem. Yeah, I think we're also very, like Neil said, we are very attached or attached to forms, right? The formal, uh, I think that will have to go in a sense. The law for forms will be replaced by the law for experiences, right? The AI system will create spaces that create experiences, and the experience will be the reason to have the space for, not the other way around, right? It's not only about protective. That, that was the, the lower level, right? The low level. You need protection against the cold or the, the, the I know now it will be different. It will have other needs, higher level needs, right? I want intimacy, I want to have this engaging spaces, I want to have spaces that are changing and dynamically pushing me forward. So it will be a much more complex demand from, from the space 
than the initial protect me from the elements, protect me from the enemies, right? It will be much more. And this much more, I think we need the help of, of a, a deep uh, system that can understand, correlate, extrapolate, and, and, and create those kind of, let's say, outcomes for us. And the architect will be somewhere in the middle. I think architect will be welcome in the, <laughs> if you love that metaphor, right? This kind of in-between element that will not be uh, as powerful as it is now, because he definitely will not, but it will have maybe more impact. It will maybe impact more space. It will create more spaces than a normal architect would, because normally you have the superstars building at what? 100 buildings, one, one, 200 buildings, right? And that's their contribution. Imagine a system that can build millions or millions of spaces. I'm not talking about buildings themselves, right? So this is something I think very interesting to, to think about, but we have to leave our, uh, when, when I did my, my diploma 15 years ago, whatever, 12 years ago, the, the, the first thing I said, I, I, I said, I don't understand the city of Bucharest. I cannot possibly understand, even if I am a smart guy, nobody can understand, no, not even a city that, uh, as small as Bucharest, not to say Shanghai or whatever, right? So I started from the fact that I needed to simulate, I needed to, to explore, and the simulation, I just wanted to mention that simulation would be one of the main elements of, of the, of, from the, the designers, let's say, tools, of, or it will probably even replace the path, right? You'll be able to simulate systems to see what they uh, give, and of course, AI will be a pivotal uh, part of that. And I think before we get completely obsolete, which we will, <laughs> we'll, we'll be our role will shift into this kind of simulation masters, or even not, not, not even the masters, the simulation will be inputting things and will be uh, interpreting results. That will be the first stage, right? Because now we have a problem. AI are, AIs are, are giving you 100 or 200 equally valid from a technical standpoint solutions, right? So how do you choose the, the best one? And now we still use our intuition. This one looks, seems to be better for some reason. We cannot say for sure why, because technically they're all the same, but this one has a better, I don't know, aesthetic, maybe give some other layer of complexity. And this is, we will be doing that for a while, but not very long. We'll be given the inputs and the outputs, and then slowly we'll create systems to create inputs and system to judge the outputs, right? And at some point we kind of <laughs> move away and slowly look at the beautiful system we've created. And, and, and again, either we merge with them or find some other way to, to still be relevant. And that's the, the quest, I think, of the architect. How do we still, as humans, are still relevant in this process? Because I can see a very easy 30 years transition or 20 years transition, but after that, I cannot say exactly what to make us relevant still. Unless again, we refuse or we somehow merge with the technology itself, or we enhance our brains to, I don't know, to become like a Borg in a sense, to be able to think collectively or do something else that we couldn't do before. But if we keep to our, our own special, you know, flowers, all of them are, are very, Special, that would be the, 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 the way to, to die very, very fast and very painful, I would say, right? Because you'll, you'll be faced with something so so exponentially more powerful, more and more intelligent, more more relevant to the, to the problems that, like Neil said, clients will want to bypass you as a risk. You'll be the risk in, in the whole equation. You'll be the creative, you know, uh, people, that, a person that believes it's a genius, but actually will just screw the project, add timelines, uh, like delay, things and they don't want that they want precision they want uh, you know comprehensiveness of the problems of the the, the 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 problem is being analyzed from 20 50 perspectives not just from one egotistic one so let's be careful about that architects always have been famous for having big egos it's a moment to either combine those egos into something like a super ego that will match but probably can't or we will have to learn that our egos were kind of undeserved and with this kind of like they need said our, our perception of being special is not quite so justified as we think, especially as creators, right? S sorry for the long intermission. Um, thank you. I just want to add um, last addition um, on regards of, of uh, um, the creativity part and so on. I just uh, mentioned that because I, I uh, first of all, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm an IT student, I'm not architect, but I'm very keen and um, I think architecture is a field that, um, quote unquote vertile that we can improve with the lots of IT infrastructure. I think Neil touched uh, a point that is um, a very good research area to explore, which is creating some sort of uh, architecture specific language that is machine readable and so on. But um, I mentioned what uh, uh, I wanted to put the creativity uh, hat a little bit on because I feel like there should be some sort of uh, a balance that we need to strike um, in the students 
to not discourage them to explore new ideas and so on. But the, the, I never said that. We, I think, uh, yeah, I, I mean, that. That's the point. I mean, no, no, because yeah, I imagine, like, as a student, uh, as an architect student, uh, there might have been some sort of attention that, oh, there will be a machine that will take over what I have been doing for the last five, ten years, and so on. And it some sort it could give for some students that some sort of a discouragement that um, AI going to take over uh, my place and so on. But um, what I imagine it is, and this is just uh, my opinion, is that I what I imagine that AI could actually work very well alongside uh, architects, mm -hmm. where um, they basically amplify the tool of AI to, instead of exploring uh, the ideas inside their mind, they could explore them exactly. inside uh, some sort of a virtual space and so on. This is true, but it will take so yes for a while. Yes, you're right. But after a while, <laughs> all of the because we mentioned that the system yes will be able to translate inputs better to, to, to make the system of the outputs also better for a while. <laughs> but that's the only point. Yes, you're right for a while. The point is that on the long run, I mean long, not not even 30 years, so you'll not get uh, uh, retired <laughs> before that. You'll have to do to play this role, but then you you'll see that the, the, the complexity of the system we are going to be building are going to be uh, so so uh, let's say overwhelming that your role in the end again if we don't invent or reinvent ourselves so if you just go to, to the same university have the same curriculum and, and expect some wonderful thing to happen it won't happen I, I can assure you and I, I know the Miku is in that sense a little bit more conservative than it should be not not only Miku but most schools are some of the schools in the world have realized that and they're trying to <laughs> to do something different like Neil is doing. Uh, uh, in, in multiple locations, and I totally agree. By the way, to me, the the perspective of having the best professors in the world uh, brought together for a couple of days uh, in the same place was the best or the better form. Uh, that I could never imagine having so many talented people in one place. If I go to MIT, I only have one or two guys. If I go to Harvard, I have one or two guys. Right. So this idea of, uh, in a sense, opening up uh, also the, the, the academics field, and I think digital future is doing that very well, right? We have so many interesting uh, things happening every every week, basically, right? So you, if you, for you guys, this is a I would call a very interesting resource to explore, which kind of in in some ways may maybe going in in, in in a different direction from what the school is teaching you at the moment. And I would beg to say that the school is wrong, here. <laughs> not uh, <laughs> the digital future uh, vision, of course, and. and that school itself will have to reinvent. So Minku it's a, has positive, uh, let's say, uh, qualities. It, I think uh, teaching people to draw uh, by hand in, in a world of, of AI is not without benefits. It, it, it's interesting, the discussion, right? So some skills, although weird, like folding the T-shirt the and creating the <laughs> design based on that, right? Like your student did, uh, Neil, uh, are, are relevant in a sense because you still have to train aesthetics and you still have to train some things if you want to be able to appreciate the beauty of the outcome of the AI. At some point, you will become ignorant even to, to be able to appreciate what, what interesting designs AI is going to produce if we don't have the means to, to identify that. So at least in that sense of being able to at least appreciate right, uh, the, the beauty and, 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 the, and the complexity, we still have to, to train ourselves. However, the way that this is happening now in, in, in the academic space is very different. Right, so there are more progressive schools, and I think Neil can also say that even the what they were called very progressive schools, as, such as AA and the other ones, have kind of lost a little bit of uh, one, uh, let's say, uh, how to call it, one star, right? <laughs> because if if they're not trying to catch up very fast with this kind of changing environments uh, of, of education, right? Especially on the pandemic front, because now with the Brexit and everything going to the AA is, I mean, super expensive. So why would you go physically there when you can have this kind of open education systems and basically learn kind of the same? I'm exaggerating, of course, but you know what I mean, right? So why go to school in the <laughs> in the end, right? We should wrap this up because I mean it's kind of yeah. going to start sorry, 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 sorry. education. But let me just I, mean, I want to finish maybe with a, just a comment, and that is to say that I think you've got the seeds of something already in Iominku, right? And, and both of Tari there. But I think the other person that we haven't mentioned, right? Always, I was always been intrigued by is. Is Doreen Stefan. You know, and he always thinks outside the box in the most extraordinary kind of way, you know, and that is something really to be treasured. To, I mean, we've got to think outside the box. And I remember once, uh, uh, and I'm not sure if you were there, Cloudy, but he, there was a presentation in London, um, and it was yeah. interesting because there was 
it was like the future of the city, right? And then yeah. the first guy who came on was at the Royal Institute of Planning or something like that. And this guy was Vitruvius. Like the, there are 10 principles to planning, and he went through these different yeah. things. And, and, uh, and Doreen came and said, I don't know what the future of the city is. Now, no idea, but I think it's going to be like a flock of pigeons. And, and I was sitting next to this guy from the, from the Royal Institute of whatever it was, who was like looking at looking squirming and saying, what is this guy talking about a flock of pigeons? And I think it was Claudia's project that was being shown. And, and you know, that's the, the, the key is to really jolt ourselves outside this old fashioned framework of thinking that straight lines are sacred and to be open to radically new ways of thinking. I think that in a sense is the first thing to open the door to that kind of thing. And I, I just think that Doreen is a, is a real treasure. I think he's a, has the capacity to think in a very imaginative way. And uh, that's the future you should lock into. Um, but speaking of the future, I've got to get on with my paper for the future of education this week. But I just want to thank you for the opportunity to say something. It's great to see you, Claudio, again. It's great to, Augustine's gone, but it's great to see him. And I don't know if Dana Weiss was here, but it would be, I, I, it, but she's also someone very special having her in Romania. I just really encourage you guys to, to take a look at, I, I put the link in there. I don't know if you could share that link of some of the debates about AI, neuroscience and architecture, because something's happening that's radically, radically very new. Um, uh, so, uh, someone saying they've got a question. If it, if it can be a one-eyed answer, um, Francesca Coleman, do you want to ask that question? I'll, I'll answer that and then I've got to go. Just... <laughs> yeah, 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 sorry. I'll, I'll make it very quick. Well, um, do you think that AI will ever be capable to think, draw, or experiment like a, like a child or in a childlike manner? Or is it already doing that? Should it ever do that? Yeah, well, okay. first of all, AI cannot think any more than your, your pocket, calculator, pocket calculator can think. It can play a game of go against you or chess. It doesn't know that it's playing that. The key question, and, and this is what the difference, the key difference, I didn't think I mentioned this too much. I should have mentioned it, sorry. The difference between us and AI is that we have consciousness. But, but the real question is whether consciousness is, is really that important, especially in terms of architecture. You know? um, and I think that uh, Nova, uh, Yuval Harari says this kind of comment, you know, there are many routes to superintelligence and not all of them pass through the straits of consciousness and do we need the conscious when they're who cares when they're producing incredible architecture and i don't think that necessarily consciousness is that important and i don't necessarily think it's tied to greater computational power although gpt3 according to david chalmers is kind of uh, approaching something akin to that so uh but I mean, I don't know. Let's see what the future what the future brings. But you know, what I would say is is that throw away if, if you are, agree with this. Oh no, absolutely. I think everybody should be forced be forced to listen to this. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and see you next time.